Hello there, welcome to the Saray channel and welcome to my Omnibus series. I've got so many of these Omnibuses that are going to come out so that you'll be able to listen to an hour's worth of stories which I know you're going to love. You know, the thing is that telling stories is such a fine art and it's something that was practiced hundreds of years ago when people didn't have the technology that we have today. And everyone would gather around the fire and listen to a wonderful story. And also, what is so wonderful about a story is that, personally, I think it is the best way to go to sleep. Every night when I go to bed, I always listen to stories. And that's something that parents used to do with their children. It's something that they still do with their children. There's nothing better than a good story. And so I hope you're going to enjoy this series. And before we start, I just want to say, do subscribe to my channel because you don't want to miss out on anything because I'm in for the long haul and I want to make sure that you get the most stunning stories to go to bed with at night or to listen to when you want to be one of those people sitting beside the fire and listening. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and let's get started. I hope you're going to enjoy the Omnibus. Dear Sarah, and all your lovely listeners. My name is Bob and I grew up in North America in the early 70s but I would prefer not to give the geographical coordinates of where that was for obvious reasons. Growing up my family consisted of both my parents and my young brother Malcolm. We resided in a quaint 1700s charming cottage with whitewashed brick walls and large sash windows and a rather unique crooked chimney that was situated on a couple of acres of land. We lived in a countrified, rather remote area, surrounded by acres of dreamy forest, horse-riding trails, mountainous valleys, flowery meadows and plenty of farms, with the added advantage of being only about 15 minutes away from the main town. As a young boy, the town was a great spot to meet up with all my friends, where we would eat ice creams at the local parlour, or spend much time playing at the park. As far as any small town goes, we had our fair share of quirky, eccentric characters living among us, some that we loved to hate, most particularly the very elegantly attired unmarried Miss Maggie Peterson, otherwise known as the Magpie, for a very good reason, of course, that was only known by the locals at the time. The pencil-thin Miss Peterson was in her early seventies and was glamorous with long brown shoulder-length hair and a peachy skin that was in remarkably good condition for a woman of her advancing years. Rest assured, you would never ever find Miss Peterson dressed in anything other than star-studded party frocks that were more suited for a fancy evening at the opera than hanging around our small town or roughing it in the countryside. Everything in that woman's wardrobe was ostentatious and sparkly. She would often wear swanky and glossy gold or silver dresses or clothes adorned with hundreds of sparkling fake diamonds or diamante crystals. Never a day in my life did I ever see that woman wear anything drab or mundane, and I'm almost certain that she only ever shopped in the glamorous evening sections of department stores. I think the harmless, gentle Miss Peterson thoroughly enjoyed putting her unscrupulous nose into everybody's business, but not quite in the way that you might imagine. Much like an investigative reporter or a foxy private eye, the tactile Miss Peterson was a hands-on sort of person. She was the kind of discerning character that would know exactly what outfit you took to the dry cleaners for cleaning, or how much you spent on your weekly shop that week, or what grade your kid got for the school math test, but she would find these things out by surreptitiously reading your school reports lying around your home, or stuffed bills that were scrunched up in a jacket pocket. It was weird because she filled her mind with nonsensical trivia that was so meaningless and inconsequential. But to Miss Peterson, it was fascinating. On reflection, I think that she found people's lives and ritzy glamorous clothes all incredibly alluring. If she visited your home, she would always open your fridge to examine the contents with her beady eyes, making a mental note of the type of mayonnaise you purchased or what your favourite brand of yoghurt was, as all these little details about your life were a source of great intrigue for the likes of Miss Peterson. 
Another curious anomaly is that she visited the townsfolk with social impromptu surprise calls that invariably almost always meant she arrived at the most inconvenient time, which many folk believed was intentional and deliberate on her part, almost to catch you off guard. She would arrive at your place while you were running around like a bat out of hell or were in the middle of taking a much-needed shower. Those were the times that I would hear my mother screaming, That dreadful woman! Why won't she leave us alone? Why does she have to arrive on the scene when I have a hundred and one things to do? Miss Peterson would assure you that while you were picking your kids up from school, she would stay and hang around at your home and entertain herself until you got back, and she meant every word of it. I can assure you that from the moment your back was turned, you can be sure she got to work on raiding through all your stuff in a frenzied excitement and trying on any of your clothes that sparkled or were glitzy in any way. Yet despite her fervent passion and curiosity, Miss Peterson was honest, candid, forthright and incorruptible, and she would never have borrowed something from you without asking first, but that was where the boundaries began and ended for her. If she arrived at your house for tea, she would always insist on taking a much-needed trip to the ladies, and on the way there she would mischievously ferret around in all the bedrooms, having a jolly good snoop around, and if she got caught in the process, she would pretend she had lost her way, even though you had distinctly told her that the ladies was under the staircase. Oh, I didn't hear you, she would say. I thought you said it was on top of the stairs. It was common to find her three floors up in your home, presumptuously rummaging and meddling through your stuff, rather like an exuberant vagrant at a jumble sale. One of my mother's neighbours found her in the upstairs bedroom once, trying on one of her glamorous pink gold evening gowns with a rather dashing fluffy pink scarf to match, which she had placed on over her clothes and was seen admiring her reflection in the long cupboard mirror. Upon seeing our neighbour standing in the doorway of her bedroom, staring at her in astonishment with what the heck are you doing kind of expression written on her face, Mrs Peterson would promptly pull off the dress and scarf and replace them into the bewildered neighbour's hands, as if she'd been at a cubicle at a clothing store and was rejecting the items. Not very nice, she'd said, referring to the clothes. Much too brassy for my liking, I'm afraid. And then she'd look directly at our neighbour, squarely in the eyes, as if nothing had transpired, and said, Where did you say the lady's cloakroom was? I completely forgot. She would give herself away by saying to me, Bobby, how long have you been playing the flute? And how old is your hamster? I assure you, there is no way she could have known these personal details about me without having snooped in my bedroom to begin with, as my flute was locked away in my cupboard, and my hamster was hidden in the far corner of the bedroom during the day, and his cage was always covered with a towel when he was sleeping. You pretty much knew if Miss Peterson was coming around, because she'd invariably go officiously prying, so you better had nothing to hide. Mrs Peterson generously offered her services for babysitting completely free of charge to any of the townsfolk, possibly as an excuse to go ferreting around when unsuspecting backs were invariably turned. Many people claimed that after she'd been babysitting for them, even their mail had been tampered with and any glamorous clothes with a hint of a sparkle were left hanging on the hangers inside out, looking ominously like they'd been tried on. Miss Peterson enjoyed trying any glitzy clothes on, or anything that sparkled, gleamed, shone or glittered, which included people's jewellery, which was why she earned the name the magpie by the folk in our town, as magpies are duly noted for picking up glitzy things and placing them in their nests, as just like Miss Peterson, they have an eye for anything shiny. My parents didn't really care if Miss Peterson snooped through their stuff when she visited our home, as they were pretty laid back and easy going sort of people at the very best of times, who pretty much wore their heart on their sleeves. And as for secrets, they didn't have any. In those days, hiring a babysitter for free was something not to be sneezed at, and so invariably Miss Peterson spent many a long night watching over us as little children while my parents went out painting the town red. I rather liked Miss Peterson, because despite all else, she was kind and caring. When Malcolm and I were little, she would tuck us up into bed and read us a bedtime story. Then later on in the evening, we would hear her surfing, rustling and rattling around through drawers, and examining all our family stuff, and looking through old family photographs. My brother and I would giggle to ourselves, as we thought it terribly funny, 
that Miss Peterson was such a big snoop. We knew she'd be trying on my mother's evening wear by now, or possibly reading her private diary, which was exceedingly boring, as my mother would write things in her diary like, Pretty mundane day, rained a lot, cooked chicken hot pot roast for lunch, and visited mum's grave. My brother Malcolm used to joke that Miss Peterson's nose would grow so long as a result of all her snooping, and the irony of ironies is that this glamorous woman with her dark chocolate beady eyes really did have a somewhat pointed beak-like nose, which I thought was very befitting for a woman known as the magpie, which I really thought suited her down to a T. One evening after Miss Peterson had tucked us up into bed and read us our favourite bedtime story about a very happy little hippo called Wally. Then she kissed us on the cheeks good night and switched off the bedroom lights, leaving the door ever so slightly ajar. I smiled secretly to myself in amusement as I pulled the sheets over my face. She could be heard rummaging through all our family stuff, surreptitiously trying to be very quiet to conceal her sneaking activities, but with very little success. All of a sudden I could hear Miss Peterson let out a huge terrified scream. I sat upright in my bed and thought, did I hear that or was I dreaming? I had been drifting off to sleep and it was very difficult to distinguish reality from fiction. I could have sworn I'd heard her scream, but was I imagining it? I sensed something felt really off. I felt like I was gripped with a growing sense of unease. I could hear what I can only describe as a frenzied Miss Peterson charging around the house frantically, rather like a bull in a china shop, and opening up cupboards in a haste, banging doors behind her loudly. She seemed noisier than usual, almost as if she was not even attempting to cover up her insatiable curiosity. That wasn't like her at all. It was in that second I sensed something untoward was going on, and so in my pyjamas I ventured out of my bedroom. I could see Miss Peterson hurriedly bolting down the staircase in a sparkling evening gown of my mother's, wearing high-heeled silver slippers, carrying my father's hunting rifle in her hands, and dashing out of the side door as if she was in hot pursuit of something. But what she was after, I couldn't imagine. What on earth was she doing, I wondered. It seemed like her behaviour was unusually odd this evening. I quickly followed her with a growing sense of intrigue. Perhaps this nosiness lark that had consumed Miss Peterson's life was seriously infectious and I had caught it, because now I was growing increasingly curious myself. Go away! Shoo! I could hear Miss Peterson shouting. Go away! Go away, you creep! Get away! Leave! It was almost as if she was telling a strange dog to get off the property. All of a sudden she began firing some random shots after the mystery creature, with my father's rifle, and that was when I saw this huge, dark, shadowy silhouette thundering towards her like a bull charging a red flag at a bullfight, and the red flag in this scenario was no other than Miss Peterson herself, who was now screaming at the top of her lungs, Help! Help! Please help! Help! Whatever on earth this creature was, it appeared to be enraged and maddened. I got the distinct impression that Miss Peterson's random shooting had provoked and inflamed the situation, only making it a thousand times worse, rather like putting petrol on a fire that was dying out anyway, and reigniting and aerating the flames, turning them into an outrageous, wrathful inferno. Everything was happening so quickly, as it invariably always does in any violent scenario, when your life flashes before you, and things take forever to unfold when in reality what seems to last a lifetime has only been a matter of seconds, but your recall is so vividly pronounced that it is indelibly marked on your memory with such crystal clear clarity, and this is what this moment was like for me. Only I was the spectator of this event rather than the victim, so for me it was tantamount to watching a movie. I remember thinking in those memorable seconds, what on earth is this extraordinary creature? I've never seen anything like it before. It ran towards Miss Peterson, its overlong arm swinging vigorously backwards and forwards, and it seemed prepped for a fight, rather like a warrior on a battlefield. This virile, Herculean creature was the size of a great giant. It was easily as tall and as wide as our front door, with such huge, powerful legs and a funny-shaped arched head. Despite some of its unusual features, 
of this able-bodied creature. In my opinion, it did appear to possess a rather remarkable human-like profile, along with a man's face, but it was covered from head to toe with long flowing dark hair, and it smelt like petrichor, which is that earthly scent you smell after the rain falls on the soil. I actually really love that smell. As it lunged boldly and fearlessly towards Miss Peterson, it grabbed my father's rifle from her hands and bent it effortlessly backwards like some people can bend spoons with their minds. It was almost like the rifle was soft and pliable for him, much like plasticine. It threw the twisted metal into the bushes, where it disappeared into the long grass and was visibly no longer seen. Then it grabbed Miss Peterson, who was now screaming, tossing her over his gargantuan shoulders like a sack of potatoes, where I could see her tiny body wiggling wildly and her skinny legs kicking desperately to escape the critter's clutches. But his unassailable strong hands had held her down on his strapping rock-hard shoulders. They were so powerful, I knew she would never be able to escape his forceful grip, for this creature was impregnable, robust and invulnerable. In that second I was so frozen in shock that I just stared at these inopportune proceedings evolving before my very eyes, feeling almost certain that I would never ever lay my eyes on Miss Peterson again, and that she was either in the process of being kidnapped or would end up as a tasty meal for this monstrous beast. I couldn't decide what was the most likely scenario, but either way you looked at it, things were not looking favourable as far as Miss Peterson was concerned, and I was pretty certain that she was a goner at the very least. While all this was transpiring, I could hear Miss Peterson shouting, Put me down! Put me down! Put me down! And then her voice branched out into a series of desperate helps that sounded ominously like a yapping dog, followed by some muffled high-pitched screams. The critter glided with her towards the old oak tree in our yard. For a second he stood very still and hurled the frightened woman up and down in the air exactly like a ball, catching her in his hands every time. I truly think he skillfully incorporated these cunning scare tactics in his artful manoeuvres against the poor woman to maximise her terror, and it was clearly working, for indeed Miss Peterson was so petrified that by this time she was frozen solid in fear, and uttered not a word, seemingly resigned to her inevitable fate or demise. I must confess she looked as frail, fragile, delicate and pathetic as a Barbie doll in this creature's burly arms and sizable hands. Finally he chucked her on the ground, discarding her body under the oak tree, like a piece of rejected and felicious litter, where it rolled backwards precariously until it stopped and settled yards away from the large voluptuous tree trunk. The critter then snorted in absolute disgust, gliding away, jumping over the white wicker fence with the ease of a horse and disappearing into the trees until it was gone from our sight, moving with a graceful agility that was seamless. For a second it was hard to process what I had observed, as it seemed far too incredulous to be real. I think I was too bewildered and dumbfounded to even be remotely scared as I should have been, for fear can easily be hijacked by complete, total and utter astonishment as was the case with me. In haste, I bravely bolted towards poor Miss Peterson and began to valiantly shake her body to make sure that she wasn't dead. In truth, I feared the worst, but hoped for the best. Miss Peterson? Miss Peterson? Miss Peterson, are you all right? The woman opened her eyes and on seeing me peering over at her, began to scream and fight me back with her hands, thrashing me violently. Go away! "'Go away! Go away!' she shrieked. "'Miss Peterson! Miss Peterson! It's all right! It's only me!' It took a while for Miss Peterson to come around and compose herself, and once she had seemingly calmed down, she sat bolt upright and looked directly at me. "'Oh, it's you, Bobby,' she said. "'It's you! What happened?' "'I think you know more about that, Miss Peterson, than I do,' I said, reaching out with my hand to help her rise up from the ground, back onto her feet. And I was relieved to see that the willowy, sylph-like woman was walking with a little bit of a hobble, but was no worse for wear, as clearly nothing was broken. But she held on to my shoulders for support as we returned to the house. I led Miss Peterson to our kitchen and immediately put on the kettle, 
as my mother had taught me that when you've had a shock of any kind, nothing beats a cup of sweet hot tea. And at ten years old, I knew my way around the kitchen exceedingly well and was a dab hand with making tea and offering tons of chocolate biscuits to our guests. I watched Miss Peterson sitting down on the kitchen chair, staring vacantly into space, while I prepared the tea for us. I could discern her face was as white as a sheet, and her eyes were as wide as saucers, and I could see that she was shivering like you do when you're very cold. And so I went to fetch a blanket for her, which I threw over her shoulders, and which she wrapped around her body gratefully. I handed Miss Peterson the sweet tea, which I'd loaded with ten full teaspoons of sugar, as I figured the sweeter the better. Miss Peterson's arthritic hands were shaking, and when she held the teacup, her fingers wobbled precariously, and the tea in her cup began to move around like the waves of a tempestuous sea. Did you see it, Bobby? Miss Peterson asked me, studying me curiously with rounded, alarmed looking arms. Yes, I did, I admitted. What was it, Miss Peterson? I asked. A monster! A demon! A creature from the very depths of hell, she said, looking at me earnestly. That thing! That thing! It nearly killed me! You saw it throwing me up in the air, didn't you? Like a rag doll! She grabbed my hand suddenly. Bobby! Bobby! I nearly died tonight, she said. What happened, Miss Peterson? I asked, watching her draining the teacup in one large mouthful, which must have tasted as sickly as sugar syrup. But Miss Peterson did not seem to mind. Nice tea, Bobby, she said. Your mother has taught you well. I could see that the colour had returned to Miss Peterson's cheeks, and even her fingers had stopped shaking. It was only then that I noticed that Mrs. Peterson was wearing my mother's favourite dress, that was now completely ripped down the middle, and was brand new. I knew she was excited about wearing the pretty dress to a friend's wedding, and Miss Peterson had completely ruined it for her. And when my mother found out about this, she would be less than amused. But I knew better than to say anything, as Miss Peterson was very sensitive right now. Bobby, I was in your parents' bedroom. She said. The light was fully on. You know, dear, when you're out in the yard, that if the light's on in any room in the cottage, you can see everything that's going on in the house from the outside. I'd failed to pull the curtains, I'm afraid. Now there's a tree very close to your parents' bedroom window, and I was trying on your mother's pretty dress and examining myself in the mirror when I sensed that I was being watched by something. It was a creepy, insidious feeling that sent horrible chills down my spine. But how could anybody be watching me, as I was alone in your parents' bedroom? Yet I could feel eyes staring at me, and then I looked towards the window, and I hadn't drawn those curtains, and that was when I saw it. It was the most massive creature standing there on a very large tree branch, watching me like a perverse peeping tom. But whatever this thing was. It was not entirely human, and its face—it scared the hell out of me. It was like a monster, big, wide, and hairy, but a face that was so human, it was almost unnerving. Was it being aggressive towards you? I asked. No, but it was staring at me, Bobby. It was spying on me. I felt aggrieved and offended by its impudent behaviour. It just didn't stop staring. Well, maybe it was admiring how pretty you look in my mother's dress. I suggested, Bobby. I don't care if it was admiring me. The thing was watching me, like a peeping tom. It was staring. Were you afraid? I asked. Well, it gave me one hell of a scare, Bobby, spying on me like that. But I didn't know what it was, and I couldn't see it too clearly. But I wanted it gone. So you went looking for my father's rifle and went chasing after it. How did you manage to open my dad's gun cabinet in the first place? He keeps it locked to prevent accidents, and he hides the key. Well, I know where your father keeps his key," said Miss Peterson. "He tapes it to the bottom of his desk in his study." I was exceedingly impressed, as even I didn't know where my dad kept the keys to his gun cabinet. "You're a genius," I said. "You're a super sleuth." I'd never look there for a key. When my parents got back to the house, and my mother saw every light on in the cottage, 
and Miss Peterson and I sitting at the kitchen table having tea at about one o'clock in the morning. She was far from pleased. Worse still, when she saw Miss Peterson was covered in mud and had ripped her brand new best dress to pieces, she was less than amused. What's going on here? she screamed. And why is Bobby up, Miss Peterson? You know that my boys should be in bed by 8.30 sharp. You know the rules. Your son has been a saint tonight, Miss Peterson said. You should be proud of him. He rescued me from the beast. What beast? asked my mother, looking appalled. You're not making any sense, Miss Peterson. Have you been drinking? Of course not, said Mrs. Peterson, looking indignant. You know I never touch the stuff. Well, I sincerely hope not, said my mother, eyeing her ever so suspiciously. Because I can't have anyone watching over my boys if they're surreptitiously drinking behind my back. Do you understand? I'm sorry, Mrs. Peterson, but you do sound inebriated and intoxicated. Can you categorically assure me that you haven't been drinking tonight? She's not drunk, Mummy, I protested. She's just had a terrible shock, that's all. A shock? said my mother. What kind of a shock? Did someone break in? Should I be calling the sheriff? You're beginning to scare me. Nothing like that, I assured my mother. There was a peeping Tom spying on Miss Peterson when she was trying on your dress in your bedroom. A peeping Tom? said my mother, looking aghast. You mean a stranger was staring at you getting dressed in the middle of the night, of all things? Who is this vile man? We must report him to the sheriff at once. How did he manage to look into the bedroom? It's on the second floor, for goodness sake. He was standing on the branch of the large walnut tree outside your bedroom window, looking in at me, said Miss Peterson. He was pressing his face right against the window. His head was huge. My mother quickly opened her handbag and grabbed out a pen and paper. Give me a detailed description. What did he look like? I'll pass it on to the sheriff pronto. The man must be caught immediately, because this could happen again, and the last thing we need is a peeping Tom in this area. I think he was about seven foot tall and three foot wide at the shoulder area. He was covered in hair from head to foot, with the exception of his face. His face looked a lot like your husband's, actually. Masculine and rugged, said Miss Peterson, suddenly giggling inappropriately. <laughs> Miss Peterson, you are drunk, said my mother throwing down the pen in exasperation. I'm not going to listen to all this nonsense. Seven foot, three foot wide. Oh, what on earth are you talking about? Covered in hair and looking like my husband? More to the point, why are you wearing my brand new dress that you've ripped to shreds? And why were you dressing in my room in the first place? That's what I want to know. It was so pretty, said Miss Peterson. I had to try it on. It's a lovely dress. Not any more. I'm sorry. Do you have any idea how expensive it was, Miss Peterson? said my mother. I was going to wear it to my best friend's wedding. And now, thanks to you, it's completely ruined. All of a sudden, my dad entered the room with a grim, solemn look on his face. Someone has ransacked my rifle cabinet. And my high-powered rifle is missing, he said. It was very expensive, and it's gone. Mrs. Peterson took your rifle, Dad, to run after the beast, but the creature bent it backwards and threw it into the bushes near the oak tree before it actually attacked her. How did you manage to open my cabinet, Miss Peterson? asked my father, looking bemused. She's a super sleuth, Dad, I piped proudly. She knows exactly where you keep your key hidden, right there under the desk. Lovely, said my father, exiting the room and venturing out of doors to search for his rifle. You've some explaining to do, Miss Peterson, said my mother. Why are you making up all these crazy, preposterous stories about beasts? And what are you filling my son's head with? You're making him believe all this crazy stuff. Because what she's telling you is true, Mum, I insisted. Why would we lie to you? Miss Peterson is lucky to be alive tonight, because I saw the beast too, and it did throw her up in the air like a ball and offloaded her near the tree there. And I'm not making any of this up. I don't know what it was, but it was like a giant human being with lots of long flowing hair. And we're telling you the truth. My father entered the room very silently, carrying his bent rifle. The expression on his face was astonished. 
sweetheart. I don't know what attacked Miss Peterson tonight, but I'm inclined to believe her story. No normal creature could have bent my rifle back like this. This is extraordinary. Whatever did this was incredibly strong, and it clearly was not of a human source, because no human could possibly do this. My mother looked astonished as she took my father's rifle from him and examined it, her eyes growing as round as saucers and her jaw dropping to the ground. Oh, my goodness! Who could have done this? This is incredible! Exactly my point, said my father. Something happened here tonight, but what? I cannot imagine. A week or so after that incident, my mother received a parcel in the post, and it was a beautiful dress for Miss Peterson, far more exquisite than my mother's original dress, with a note which read, I'm really sorry for messing up your dress. I hope this will be a good enough replacement for you. My mother was well and truly humbled, because even though Miss Peterson was a nosy person with a passion for all things glitzy, she didn't have a mean bone in her entire body. She shouldn't have done this, said my mother. This is the most incredible dress I've ever seen in my life. I mean, it probably cost her a fortune. I mean, I probably already owe Miss Peterson dozens of dresses already for all the free babysitting she's done for us over the years. I do feel heartily ashamed of myself. It was about six months after that strange erroneous event, when my father was taking out the rubbish at night, when he stopped dead in his tracks, as watching him from the tree line was a creature that fit the description of the one that Miss Peterson and I had seen that night. My father was astounded by the dark silhouette he saw, and described the creature as benevolent and rather curious. It watched him for a while, and then turned around and glided away. He never saw it in detail, but did determine that it probably was the same creature. Looking back all these years later, I'm in no doubt that the creature that attacked Miss Peterson was a Bigfoot, but I believe he never intended to harm her, for if indeed that had been the case, it would have been nothing for him to finish her off with a single blow of his hand. I believe the Bigfoot noticed the lights in our family cottage and could see activity going on in my mother's bedroom, and was inquisitive and curious, so he climbed up the tree to have a better look, pressing his face against the glass pane, obviously scaring Miss Peterson to death. Another thing to bear in mind was that Miss Peterson was trying on a very glitzy gold sparkling dress, which must have been shimmering, and that in itself would have been very eye-catching for the creature. I think the creature was curious and intrigued by Miss Peterson, and possibly even had a soft spot for woman, who knows? I imagine when she started firing after him with a rifle, he took offence to her actions and sought revenge by tossing her in the air a few times to scare her, like she had invariably done to him, by firing after him like that, which was a grievous mistake on her part to make. So, with the exception of my father's encounter with the Bigfoot, we've never really been fortunate enough to have another encounter at our home, but I'm still hoping. So there you are. That's my story. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, my name is Eloise and I'm from the Big Apple, otherwise known as New York, where I grew up in a glamorous apartment block that overlooked the bustling, very busy city that was so alive with activity and hundreds of yellow taxi cabs. I once heard someone say that if you're tired of London, you're tired of life, and I always felt the very same way about New York. There was so much going on in this exciting, vibrant, buzzing metropolis, and I found watching the throng crowds of people my greatest source of fascination. And there were indeed times walking down the sidewalk when returning home from school with my satchel flung over my shoulders that I would see two people caught up in an altercation or brawl with much arguing and fighting going on, and very soon a little crowd would gather around to watch the drama unfold, as people are always enamoured by real-life soap operas. I remember on one occasion a young woman was literally giving birth on the sidewalk, and I'm not exaggerating. I mean, how does that happen? But here in New York we've pretty much seen it all, and there's not much that surprises us any more. It would seem that the baby was coming, and nothing was stopping it. The local residents ran around getting towels, and before the ambulance arrived, the woman had given birth to a little boy 
and everyone was so ecstatic, and there was much applauding and clapping, and the proud mother was beaming from ear to ear. I'll call him York, she told us, because he was born on the street, and everybody applauded, thinking that this was the greatest idea in the entire world. I just love New York, as there was so much about this fabulous city to truly appreciate. I marvelled at the cheerful street vendors selling their cooked food, and the smells of sizzling, delectable chicken kebabs that would permeate and waft through the air, titillating your taste buds with the aromatic aromas. Then there are all the interesting shops, the delicate essences with their vast arrays of baked, delicious breads and sliced meats on display. And let's not forget the beautiful parks in New York, where you can enjoy a solitary walk on your own in nature. And eat your sandwiches under a large oak tree while you watch the world go by. During the summer months, there are bodies literally sprawled and strewn over the lawns of the parks, like lizards lapping up and soaking up the sunshine, which is a sight to behold. My story begins when one day my parents inform me that they were going on a three-week business trip to Switzerland, and that I would have to go and stay with my grandparents on their West Virginian farm, where my mother had grown up as a young girl. The last time I'd actually ever seen my grandparents was five long years ago, when I was about seven years old. So my memories of them were vague, foggy, and somewhat cloudy. But I don't want to go! I protested, stamping my foot like an insolent, spoilt brat. If I can't come to Switzerland with you, I want to stay here in New York. I don't want to go to the country to stay with strange people that I barely know. Of course, my indignant, belligerent, and acrimonious protests were ignored by my parents, who simply refused to put up with my sulking, juvenile behaviour. And eventually, I surrendered rather disagreeably to my fate, for I had no choice in the matter, as I was going to stay with my grandparents, come what may. Before long, I found myself sitting in a taxi cab, being ferried from Charleston Yeager Airport to my grandparents' farm. I remember the taxi drove past the most exquisite-looking countryside. Full of verdant rolling hills, flowering meadows, statuesque mountains, pretty farmhouses, barns, and fields filled with grazing cows or horses, and I was beguiled and bedazzled by these incredible, sensational, idyllic views. Finally, the taxi took a few turnings down some precipitous dirt roads, where the uneven rocky surfaces caused the taxi to wobble and jolt precariously, and you could hear pebbles beating against the undercarriage. Eventually, the taxi approached an open wooden farm gate with the sign "Wild Blackberry Orchards," and it veered down this long, smooth white road through this luxurious green, hilly countryside that was covered with bushy areas of ubiquitous trees and dotted with a couple of bright red barns. There were also horses grazing on a hilly, fenced elevation, swishing their tails and glancing up in our direction briefly. In a trice, the taxi driver had parked his cab and reversed in an open courtyard in front of a very impressive, rather imposing-looking 1800s farmhouse that looked like it had stepped out of the history books into our reality. And I have to admit, it was as pretty as a picture. All of a sudden, the front door burst open, and a plump woman wearing an apron around her middle with short, curly grey hair and a big beam on her face came bustling down the steps towards me, enveloping me in her arms. And covering me with hundreds of kisses. Oh, it's so good to see you, Eloise. My, you've grown. You remind me of your mother when you were her age. Oh, the likeness is quite uncanny. Do you remember me? I'm your grandmother. I shook my head. I was too small. I said, Never mind. She said, It was an awfully long time ago. I couldn't help but smile. As I wasn't used to receiving such an enthusiastic, rapturous welcome, I couldn't help but warm to this agreeable, good-natured, and amiable woman, who I realised was my grandmother. It was not long before I met my cheerless grandfather, but his reception towards me was frosty, haughty, indifferent, and very aloof. My grandmother might as well have been telling him that he was having cheese on his baked potato instead of chili. As his dispassion towards me was literally mind-blowing, I mean, I was his granddaughter for goodness' sake, who he hadn't seen in many, many years. But my presence was a very little appeal or interest to him. My grandmother did her very best to try and introduce me to the surly, crotchety, and prickly man, whom I decided at once that I didn't like. I noticed his head was buried beneath the large newspapers he was reading, and he looked up with annoyance and studied me for a moment. Through his hard, piercing, mean eyes, 
I promise you I felt like a bird being examined by the beady eyes of a sparrow hawk, as that was how menacing and uncongenial his presence was towards me. This is Eloise, said my grandmother. She'll be staying with us for three weeks now. Isn't it nice to have a young girl running around the farm? Much like old times, when Margaret was a young girl. You remember? How could I forget? So this is Margaret's daughter, said the old man, with a very disapproving look. The likeness is quite remarkable. You better behave yourself, little girl, he said, waving his finger at me warningly, as though reprimanding me for bad behaviour I had yet to commit. I'll be watching you, and if you step out of line, you will be in very big trouble. I can't abide, silly little girls. I'm not a little girl, I protested, and my name is Eloise, and I'm twelve years old, so I'm not little. My grandfather looked up at me from behind the newspaper, rather surprised to see that I'd stood up for myself. It was very clear to me that he wasn't used to such a spirited individual like myself, who wasn't afraid to fight back, and I could see that he was ever so slightly impressed by my sudden outburst, but was certainly not willing to show it. "'You're quite a feisty little girl, aren't you?' he said. "'Dreadful shame you weren't born a girl. What a dreadful waste!' At that my grandmother promptly whisked me out of the living room. "'Don't mind your grandfather,' she whispered to me. "'He's a miserable, cantankerous, grumpy old man. But if you keep out of his way, he shouldn't give you any problems.' From that point on I firmly decided to stay out of my grandfather's way as I didn't like this horrible, condescending man, who clearly loathed children, most especially girls. In fact, as far as girls were concerned, he didn't have time for them at all. I briefly recall my mother describing her father as a very authoritarian, belligerent type of parent, who was rigidly disciplined and made her life a living hell growing up. I couldn't understand why such a nice, lovely lady like my grandmother had put up with such a vindictive, nasty man, who certainly, as far as I was concerned, lacked manners and was insolent and rude. From that point on, I decided that one of the best ways to try and avoid him was to keep myself entertained in the great outdoors, so I climbed on the back of a mountain bike and began cycling all over the emerald green countryside. I realised to my amazement that I was actually enjoying myself considerably with the gentle wind blowing against my long brown hair and the evocative smell of freshly cut straw permeating the air. I parked my bicycle and eagerly ventured into the woodland area, which was exceedingly steep, as it was on a mountainous elevation, and I began to climb up this rocky terrain, until it seemed to level out and flatten over a vast area on top of the mountain, where you could observe exquisite views over many miles of the glorious pretty valley below. I was mesmerised by the beauty of the tall statuous maple and chestnut trees, along with the shorter trees covered in white blossoms that I was to learn later were service berries. All these trees seemed to stretch out their branches from a great height, providing an arched canopy above my head, and the subtle shafts of sunlight that permeated through the branches dappled the forest floor in an ethereal luminescence that was as magical as it was enchanting. The forest floor was elegantly decked out with impressive-looking voluptuous boulders that were like great works of contemporary art, that any modern art gallery would be proud to showcase, because these natural sculptures had been worn away over a vast period of time, using the weather as its masterful chisel. If that wasn't alluring enough for you, there were soft mosses, wild gingers, woodruff and lacy ferns carpeting the ground. A delightful silvery stream meandered through this whimsical fairy tale-like woodland expanse, and it burbled and bubbled as it travelled over the rocks and branches, and its pleasing sound intermingled with the bird song and was exceedingly therapeutic. I sat down on a smooth rocky ledge and just listened to the sounds of the forest. All of a sudden I noticed that the bird song dissipated and began to fade, and everything suddenly became deathly quiet, so incredibly still, in fact, that you could have heard a pin drop. I became painfully aware that I was certainly not alone as I could sense that foreboding feeling that something or someone was watching me. But who? I couldn't imagine. It was an unsettling, very airy feeling that sent cold chills travelling down my spine and made me feel this very urgent need to leave the forest at once. 
I have suffered from a neurological disorder called narcolepsy pretty much all my life, which is a condition which can cause me all of a sudden to just fall into a deep sleep, and this can happen in any situation and during any activity, which is why I wear a bracelet around my wrist to explain my condition. I have refused to allow my narcolepsy to rob me of my freedom, although I have fallen asleep in strange places before. I woke up once in a Walmart store where I'd fallen asleep over a display of baked beans and was found lying fast asleep, surrounded by a sea of tins, and the distressed customers thought I was dead, and I caused a huge frenzy in that store. Another time I woke up in a dentist's waiting room, having fallen fast asleep over the man sitting next to me. That was more than a little embarrassing, as I woke up to see his concerned face staring down at me, and his wife looking far from amused. I'm one of the lucky people with this condition, because I can go for days at a time without an episode, as I do know of people who can have five attacks a day. Unfortunately, when I'm bathing or showering, I have to be watched carefully and supervised, which can, of course, be very awkward, as I do like my privacy and loathe being watched. I think in that moment I must have had a narcoleptic episode, because all of a sudden I woke to find myself being vigorously shaken and jolted on the chest by these massive hands, by what I can only describe as this colossal humanoid being, covered in hair, staring down at me with deep-set, dark, earnest eyes that looked very distressed and discomposed. The creature smelt woody, like a damp tree trunk. I think the creature that had attempted to resuscitate me obviously thought that I must be dead. I'm one of those people that can look as if I'm dead and be rather unresponsive when I have a narcoleptic episode, as the extreme from being wide awake to falling asleep can be so dramatic that you may have the false misleading impression that I've dropped down dead in front of you. So over the years I've scared quite a lot of people with these strange episodes of mine. On this particular occasion I sat bolt upright, rubbing my eyes vigorously to ensure that I wasn't dreaming. I was sure that I must be, as I could hardly believe what I was witnessing. This incongruous creature who had been hovering over me stood up straight, towering at a very intimidating eight-foot tall, and glided away to sit next to another small-looking creature on a large boulder, yards away from where I had fallen asleep. Both of these outlandish creatures studied me with animated, curious, interested eyes, and on seeing that I was very much alive, they began to whoop with delight. I truly think they thought I had miraculously returned from the dead. The only way I can describe these anomalous creatures to you is like gigantic ape-like humanoids covered with long flowing dark brown hair with pretty auburn hues or highlights, overlong arms and rather peculiar looking cone-shaped heads, but with human faces, leathery dark skins, furrowed brows, deep-set eyes and flat noses. I was not quite sure how to react to them, for although I was overawed and daunted by their imposing, intimidating presences, they obviously had just tried to help rescue me. I was too shocked and bewildered to feel any powerful emotion driven by fear or terror. The large female creature exuded a matriarch's protective, caring energy, and she was watching me intently, appearing to be in no particular hurry to leave my side, as I sensed she was still worried about me. I heard her communicating with the smaller creature in a strange, rather peculiar language that sounded rather like Chinese, and the tone of her voice was stern and authoritative, and I could tell she commanded great respect. Instinctively I knew she was telling the younger male, who I imagine was her son, to keep a careful eye on me. Moments later she returned with a large hollowed piece of bark that was full of berries, which she handed to me, and after I ate the delicious sweet fruit, the creatures both began to whoop. I think the act of eating on my part had confirmed to them that I was going to be fine, and it warmed the cockles of my hearts that these unusual creatures genuinely seemed to care about me. The next thing I knew was that I could hear my grandfather's booming voice thundering through the woods, and he sounded less than amused. Little girl, are you up there? He called this, not even bothering to address me by my name. In that moment I panicked, and I was so terrified that my heart began to beat like a heavy drum, and the creatures, on sensing my obvious distress, immediately took a precautionary stance, and instead of running away from the approaching human, they retreated behind some trees, standing very still, and remaining wearily watchful over me, 
like invisible protective bodyguards. All of a sudden my grandfather ambled ungraciously towards me with an awkward limp in one of his legs and carrying a hunting rifle in his hand, and he was wearing an enraged look upon his face. He lifted up his rifle, pointing it directly at me and shouting, "'I knew you would get up to all kinds of mischief the moment you got here. You're just like your mother.' He sniped bitterly. "'The two of you are like peas in a pod. She was always up to no good as a little girl. It seems like the apple does not fall far from the tree. What on earth are you doing hanging around in these woods when you have that dangerous sleeping condition? You're asking for trouble.' "'It's called narcolepsy,' I piped. "'Don't try and be clever with me, young girl. You know what I'm talking about.' It's not safe for you to go wandering around the woods. If you could fall asleep in any second, you could fall into a stream and drown, or end up ravaged by a wild animal while asleep. Anything could happen to you in the woods. You're a very silly, stupid little girl. Like you care, I piped. You are right. I don't care a jot, but your grandmother clearly does. And she instructed you not to wander off too far from the house, which is why I'm here on her account. You need to get back to that farmhouse immediately and play there in the backyard so your grandmother can keep her eyes on you. She will never forgive herself if something bad were to happen to you. Nothing bad is going to happen to me, I chided. I know how to look after myself. You're a very disagreeable little kid, aren't you? It seems that your mother has failed to teach you any manners. On my watch you will do as you're told. Do you understand, young girl? If I had my way with you, you'd have a good flogging with a leather belt to knock some sense into that little head of yours. My grandmother noticed a movement suddenly from the large female creature who was watching everything from between the branches of a tree and was bopping her head to the left and to the right. All of a sudden my grandfather's wrinkled face grew very grave and he immediately reached for his rifle and began to aim it at the creature with his fingers pressing down upon the trigger. No! I screamed. No! You can't do that! Without thinking, boldly and possibly foolishly on my part, I ran quickly forwards, pushing my grandfather out of the way so that he wouldn't harm the hairy ape-like humanoids, and his bullets ricocheted, firing far away from both the creatures. But my grandfather himself went tumbling backwards down the hilly embankment, rolling down some jagged rocks, when he finally came to a complete stop. I quickly ran towards him, horrified to see that he wasn't moving and his eyes looked glazed over. His mouth was opened, and he was completely unresponsive, and I realised that he most certainly was dead, and I could see blood pooling beneath his head. It was terrifying. I tried to shake my grandfather wide awake. "'Wake up!' I cried. "'Wake up!' But he was unresponsive. I began to scramble down the steep embankment, almost sliding down the rugged mountainous path, in my desperate haste, and then finally, when I arrived on terra firma, I hightailed it towards the farmhouse like a bat out of hell. My heart was pounding violently in my chest at a thousand miles an hour, and I was breathing very heavily. I bolted through the front door, springing into the kitchen, where my grandmother was standing at the stove, stirring a thick custard with a wooden spoon. For a moment she stopped, looked at me in surprise, and then became alarmed. "'Are you all right, dear?' she asked. You look very dishevelled and out of breath. What on earth is going on? You've grown as white as a sheet. I looked at my grandmother through misty eyes that were clouded by my salty tears. I've just killed Grandpa, I told her. I'm a murderer. And at that I burst into tears. Of course you're not a murderer, said my grandmother, taking me into her arms, trying to reassure me. I'm sure whatever's happened, it was just an unfortunate accident. Now you take me to your grandfather. To cut a long story short, my grandfather was pronounced dead, and the whole tragic death was deemed as an accidental event, even when I told the police what had actually happened, against my grandmother's advice, but they assured me it was just a tragic accident, of which I was clearly not responsible. 
I was amazed how kind they were towards me, and even the coroner's report classified my grandfather's death as accidental. I didn't tell anyone about the strange hairy humanoids I'd encountered in the woods that I was trying to protect. I realize all these years later the two creatures were definitely Bigfoot. I won't forget the compassion that those creatures showed me when they thought I was dead. I could never have allowed my grandfather to kill those beautiful creatures that were so human, as ethically, in my opinion, that would be grievously wrong, unless, of course, the creatures were a dangerous threat, which they clearly weren't. A day later, my mother cut her trip short from Switzerland and arrived with her suitcase at my grandmother's farm, and the two of them embraced and sobbed in each other's arms for what seemed like ages, leaving me feeling wholly responsible for what had actually happened, and so I wished with all my heart that I could turn back time and undo this dreadful event. I'm so sorry to make you both so unhappy, I cried. I really didn't mean to push Grandfather over. It was an accident. You mustn't blame yourself, sweetheart. We're not crying because we're sad. We're crying because we're so happy, because that monster is finally dead. Your grandmother and I have longed for this day, but we never believed it would happen, because it's always the good ones that tend to die first. All of a sudden I began to learn about my grandfather and what a dark, treacherous individual he had been for over fifty-five years of marriage, and how he was a misogynist that had despised and loathed women. My grandmother had taken care of him all his life, and he had regularly flogged her with a leather belt, and sometimes even locked her up in a dark hall cupboard for a couple of days without food or water. When my mother was born, he continued to beat my grandmother up, but although he never physically assaulted my mother, he looked upon her like a lower form of pond life, and bitterly complained about how unfortunate it was that she hadn't been born a boy. He made my poor mother feel that she was never good enough. It was hardly a wonder that I hadn't a relationship with my grandparents, as my mother had been shielding me from my grandfather all of my life, and my grandmother had missed out on getting to know me over the years, but more recently my grandfather had developed heart problems and was in poor health and was less nimble on his feet, which was why for the first time ever my grandmother had deemed it safe enough for me to come and stay on her farm. Now I was the one that had contributed to his untimely death, but it would seem that there were not many in the small rural town that were sorry about his departing from the earth plane, and I think at his funeral it was more like a celebration party, as everyone in attendance was happy that he was gone, and in some way my grandfather had impacted on so many lives in such a negative way, as there was not a person at his funeral gathering that actually had a nice thing to say about the man. I was to discover that my grandmother knew all about the wild men in the woods, and she had claimed that they had lived on our farm for generations, but it would seem my grandfather had wanted them all dead, simply because they had pilferaged a few of his vegetables and fruits from our yard, which I thought was ridiculous. Thieves, he had screamed, the whole lot of them, treacherous thieves! I want these wild men off our property now, and if I get my hands on them, they're all dead. I think they knew he wanted them all dead, laughed my grandmother, because he would spend so much time searching for them and trying to catch them and kill them. They would tease him by throwing rocks at him, and then he would fire in the direction of the rocks, and he could hear them whooping with delight, as they thought it was a hilarious game, and were clearly laughing at him. But your grandfather was never amused, and the more they toyed with him, the more determined he was to kill them, and it became like an obsession for him. Did he ever manage to shoot one of those creatures, I asked in alarm. Of course not, my grandmother chuckled, because they were way too fast for him. She continued, one day when it was snowing, I could see large footsteps in the snow leading to the chicken coop, and I realised the wild people had pinched a couple of my chickens, and I knew if your grandfather found out about it, he would have a tantrum. I discerned that they were clearly hungry, so I left a large box filled with food at the edge of the woods every week during the winter months without your grandfather knowing about it. He would have been furious if he had. A wild woman would pick up the parcel and nod at me as if to say thanks, and when she ventured into the woods, I kid you not, you would hear a chorus of delighted whoops, and that would thrill me. I remember thinking that those creatures showed more gratitude for my food parcels than your grandfather ever did over a single meal I ever cooked him. All these years later, I look back on these events with nostalgia, 
and realized how privileged I was to encounter the creature that we like to call Bigfoot, and my experience with these hairy, elusive beings was a very positive one. So there you are. That's my story. Dear Sarah, and all your lovely listeners, Chloe could hear the familiar sound of her cack-handed mother, clamouring and clattering around clumsily in the downstairs kitchen, the loud, raucous racket of pots and pans being washed vigorously in the kitchen sink, by a smooth, pretty pair of hands that did not look like they were capable of inflicting much damage, but the truth could be remarkably deceptive, for Chloe's mother's hands could create chaos as masterfully as a potter can create a beautiful earthen pot on a wheel. The crashing noises Chloe's mother was making were so obtrusive if you did not know any better, you'd swear someone was throwing bricks at the exterior window of their classic-style traditional-looking home in southwest Portland, in an area known as Goose Hollow, in Mount Tomona County. No doubt Chloe's long-suffering father was standing diligently by his wife's side while she rattled the dirty dishes in the sink after the meal that they had enjoyed, on a lackadaisical, carefree Saturday evening that the family would falsely assume would pan out like any other traditional Saturday evening. But little did the Dyer family know, this evening would go badly awry in ways they never imagined possible. For if we could predict the outcome of events, we would likely make very different decisions. Chloe's father was fastidiously putting the dishes away, neatly in the kitchen cupboards, and stacking the plates on the shelves in a perfectly straight line. As everything he did, Jackson Dyer was methodical, and his organisational skills were nothing short of impressive. It was hardly a wonder that he managed a large team of people at the bank, because order and common sense were Mr Dyer's middle name. When Chloe had observed the family accounts her father kept in his offices at home, she had been staggered to find that they were so meticulous you could find anything in her father's office. Everything was so perfectly ordered. In a heartbeat you could find her father's life insurance policies, and the deeds of his will, and so it was enigmatic that such a punctilious man had married someone as disorganised as Chloe's mother was, but sometimes opposites attract. But you might say, what does a sunny day have in common with a spirited windstorm that can stir up much trouble in its wake? But against all the odds, Chloe's parents were very much in love, and got on together famously. Chloe's father had always said, I don't want to be married to someone that reminds me of myself. Goodness gracious me. I couldn't think of anything worse than staring at myself opposite the breakfast table. No, someone as fastidious as me. In another person. No, I wouldn't like that at all. Your mother's feistiness. I find it very attractive. Chloe privately thought maybe her father secretly enjoyed clearing up her mother's messes, of which there were many. It was amazing the Dyer family had never owned a dishwasher a day in their lives. But Chloe's father possibly believed a dishwasher in their household would break down as often as the washing machine had done. It would seem their plumber, an all-round handyman, Thomas Thrasher, a very rounded man with a portly physique, who had a jovial personality, receding hairline, and bright button eyes. He would wear a bright orange bandana on his head along with a pair of denim overalls, and arrived promptly at their house with a spanner in his hand, in his old battered utility vehicle, with a worn-out sign on the side which read, Thrasher's Handyman Services. This white utility van would make an alarming noisy racket as it wobbled precariously on its wheels, like an inebriated drunk. Mr Thrasher would park it directly outside the front door of the Dyer's 18th century home, Mrs. Dyer was always terrified it would break down on her driveway, as the ungainly, cumbersome vehicle was so incredibly old. It was amazing it actually still worked. But Mr. Thrasher believed, if it wasn't broken, you shouldn't get rid of it. He would arrive at the door with a big grin on his face, asking Chloe's mother, "'What is it this time, Mrs. D?' he'd say, giving her a big wink. Another hairpin of yours, stuck in the washing machine. Chloe's mother would laugh, her loud musical laugh. You know what I'm like, Mr Thrasher. I'm such a klutz, really I am. She'd invite the good-natured plumber into the house. Apologetically, 
Mr. Thrasher would say, Don't apologize to me, Mrs. D. It's people like you that keep my business thriving. You're my quintessential favorite customer. If the truth be told, he might as well move into the Dyer household, as he was around so much that he was now becoming like part of the furniture. He was always fixing one problem after another, like Lou's clogged up with toilet paper, a blocked drain, a leaking faucet, and every time the washing machine was repaired, the villainous, treacherous culprit causing the damage was usually one of her mother's mischievous hairpins that had very naughtily got lodged into a pipe or something, but how it got there remained always a perennial mystery. It was hard to believe Chloe's mother, who was so delicate and petite, and as elegant as if she'd slipped out of a bandbox, was capable of leaving so much devastation in her wake, as if a team of unbridled bison had galloped across the kitchen floor. By all accounts, it was always better when Chloe's father put things away, as the breakable object might miraculously survive the wrath of Chloe's mother's ungainly but very delicate feminine hands, and the intrepid journey from the sink to the cupboards from which they belonged without being smashed to smithereens. Chloe knew that her parents spent a great deal of money replacing broken china plates and cracked cups, but the one thing about Chloe's father, Mr. Dyer, he was a gentleman in every regard, and he never so much as complained about her mother's rough treatment of things, but instead described it as part of her charm. Chloe's conscientious father was punctiliously ordered and scrupulously methodical, working as a bank manager, and he liked everything to be particular, but knew when to keep his lips sealed to maintain the peace in the dire household, from years of learning to be tactful, when he had to refuse an aspiring entrepreneur a bank loan, based on the fact he wasn't sure of the marketability of a product that he knew would more than likely fail. He had loathed seeing the bitter disappointment on people's faces when he'd turned them away. Sometimes he'd been subjected to the abuse of people, claiming he was being completely unreasonable, but he had to remind them he was representing the interests of the bank. So in his home life, Mr. Dyer was a very diplomatic and very tactful person. He knew better than to set the cat among the pigeons. Mr. Dyer would never dream of telling his wife that the kitchen looked like a bomb had hit it, which invariably it almost always did. Even Chloe was secretly appalled that her mother was capable of making so much mess. If Chloe's father was to say such things, her mother would literally fly off the handle and get quite reactive, and would probably throw a tea towel at her husband and say, "'If it's so damn easy, then why don't you do it?' You try cooking. It's not easy to cook without making a mess. She'd then go off, thundering into the bedroom, sulking, leaving Chloe and her father to clean up the mess behind her. And Chloe's father would turn that kitchen into a shiny new pin. The truth was every time Chloe's father cooked, the surfaces would gleam and sparkle. There wouldn't be a dirty dish in sight. He still managed to produce an amazing scrumptious meal, Sometimes his scrumptious dishes were much better than anything Chloe's mother could produce. For Mr. Dyer was not afraid to be experimental in the kitchen. It's my job, he'd explain. I have to do everything rigidly by the book at the bank. But here in the kitchen, I can break loose ingeniously, throwing things together, producing masterpieces of my own. And he wasn't joking either. Chloe thought her father should start his own YouTube channel for dads who wanted to turn a simple plate of scrambled eggs into something very special. Chloe marvelled at how her dad could be so efficient. If the truth be told, Chloe was not much different to her mother. She had sadly inherited that disruptive gene, if there is such a thing, where you're inclined to be naturally messy, which meant when she made a chocolate cake, half the mixture would drop on the floor, some of it would speckle the backsplashes of the kitchen surfaces, and enigmatically find itself crystallised on the side of her mouth, which she could never explain, because it looked suspiciously if she'd been licking out the dirty bowl. But Chloe would lightly deny she would ever do such a thing. Mother and daughter were like two birds of a feather. It didn't help that they had a dog called Wilbur, a Rhodesian Ridgeback, who had a penchant for stealing all the family's shoes, which he sometimes scrupulously buried in the backyard with his large selection of dog-bones. 
sometimes half a shoe would be missing, and a quick trip into the yard, and a little archaeological dig in the ground, you might recover a family treasure, which was lightly ruined and aged by a plethora of dirt, exposure to the elements, and being buried for quite some time under the ground, which can wreak havoc on your shoes. It would seem Wilbur never managed to get his hands off any of Mr. Dyer's stuff, for the man wisely put everything away very neatly in his cupboard, a lesson that would have served her mother and Chloe rather well, if they wanted to preserve their ever-increasing selection of shoes. If the household was not chaotic enough, Chloe's mother had a habit of losing things. If she was going out on an evening, the dress she wanted to wear could never be found, so that every single drawer was ransacked, every wardrobe flung wide open, that if you didn't know better, you would think that the FBI had raided the Dyer household in search of some secret documents, and turned the house upside down, to look for the proverbial needle in a haystack, and more than likely they'd leave empty-handed, because sometimes it was impossible to find missing things in the Dyer household. On this mellow, very pleasant evening, seventeen-year-old Chloe cracked her bedroom door open, and peeked outside, as furtively as a fox clandestinely watching a rabbit burrow, to see if he could discern any activity, so that he could pounce on an unsuspecting rabbit. She listened intently. The familiar banging sounds in the kitchen were followed by the tinkle of her mother's cheerful laughter. Good, she thought. The coast is clear. She was feeling an excited thrill. Her heart was spiritedly leaping in her chest. She knew she was the quintessential envy of every girl in her school. She felt like she'd struck gold. How had she managed to get so lucky? Who would have thought that the school rising football star, who looked as if he was a doppelganger for John Travolta in his early days, when he starred sing with Olivia Newton-John, would give her even the time of day? But he'd done more than that. It was official. Chloe Dyer was now Lennox Miller's girlfriend, and as a result all the cool people in school were giving her attention, for the very first time in her life. Lennox possessed similar dark locks, like the young John Travolta had owned, and similar cornflower blue eyes, that made all the girls melt like chocolate on a sunny window sill. Everyone wanted to be noticed by Lennox Miller, but not many girls would get his attention. Who would have thought such a handsome, good-looking young man would even give her a second glance? For the last three weeks she'd been dating the quintessential school hottie, and it seemed that all her dreams had suddenly come true. For so long, Chloe had been on the outskirts of the school's popular kids, an outcast, so to speak, sitting among some of the less popular kids at school, sinking her teeth into an apple, and pretending to be caught up in Netflix movies on her iPad, but clandestinely, enviously watching the gatherings of popular kids, sitting together in congenial clusters under the large oak tree with its sculptural outstretched boughs. How Chloe wished she could belong with them! She had never felt like she fitted in, especially as in her early years she had struggled with her weight, and had often been called fatty by the bullies at school. Some mean girls would ask her if she was expecting a baby in due course. Oh, my word, Chloe! The size of your stomach! It's growing every day! You must be six months along, Lucinda Callister would say. Oh, my word! Who made you pregnant? I don't think any boy in the school would be that mad. Oh, sorry, I forgot. You're just plain fat, she had said, the corners of her lips curling up into a nasty grin. Chloe had looked at her blankly, fought back the tears of her humiliation, and trotted to the lady's toilet where she'd cried her little eyes out, swearing that when she got home she'd go on a very strict diet. She would show those vicious girls at school that she was someone that was worthy of attention. Those mean girls would never get the chance of humiliating her again. It would seem Lucinda Callister, who was considered one of the prettiest girls in the school, had a mouth on her as dirty as a sewer. It was a pity the outside did not match the inside, for the girl could be viciously cruel, and enjoyed eating up the people she hurt for breakfast. She had earned the reputation at school as the praying mantis, and had broken many a boy's heart along the way. Her heartless words had pierced Chloe to the core, but she knew some kids could be very cruel, and Lucinda was the queen of cruelty, 
with an unbridled tongue that was hardwired to cause the maximum amount of damage. It hadn't helped that Chloe had to wear braces that looked like unsightly railway tracks across her teeth, and to make matters infinitely worse, with less than a favourable eyesight, her beautiful blue eyes were swallowed up by a pair of unsightly-looking glasses that made Chloe look like she was wearing a pair of thick goggles. It was hardly a wonder no one paid her any attention, the boys never giving her a second glance. Not many could look spectacularly beguiling in a pair of goggles with thick lenses that Chloe wore that would likely make Lucinda Callister look like a real dork. How Chloe wished that Lucinda Callister would be forced to wear glasses like hers. Chloe had decided to rigidly stick to her diet and had put a picture of Lucinda Callister on the refrigerator door reminding her that every time she ate something fattening, she was only encouraging Lucinda and her unbridled tongue to spout out more poison at her and ask her when the baby was due or whether she was expecting triplets. That girl would never have the privilege to do that again to Chloe. When she would see the picture on the refrigerator, it was easy not to overindulge, and the pounds effortlessly dropped off her. She ended up getting contact lenses, and then her braces were removed. She soon became a junior cheerleader and gained an impressive level of fitness. She could stretch her legs higher than Lucinda Callister could, which made her feel incredible. One day she'd sauntered into school with a confident swagger, as now she no longer had to wear those bottle glasses again. She was bewildered to find every boy who had previously ignored her in the past was now giving her much undivided attention, along with a plethora of approving glances much to the extreme annoyance of Lucinda Callister, who was most aggrieved about the attention that Chloe was receiving, that should rightfully be hers. Lo and behold, against all the odds, Lennox Miller, of all people, had trotted up to her with a jubilant grin on his face. The dimples on his cheeks had looked cute, and Chloe's heart had melted like butter. She thought he was looking at someone else, so when he'd asked her on a date, she had looked confounded. "'You're asking me out!' she had asked incredulously, looking at Lennox as if he must have lost leave of his senses. "'Why are you so surprised?' Lennox had said. "'You're the most beautiful girl in the school, and now you've got rid of those ugly glasses. You're like a queen.' Chloe could see by his earnest blue eyes he'd meant every word of it, and was not just buttering her up. It would seem the quiet, unassuming duckling had become a swan. Chloe snuck out of her bedroom, and tiptoed across the rattling floorboards to her mother's bedroom suite. That was the problem with old houses. They'd have bones that would creak and groan when you tried to be as light as you could on your feet. But Chloe knew her parents were so caught up in their evening ritual of washing all the dishes, they were unlikely to hear her. She found herself in her mother's gleaming white bathroom that had recently been renovated at great expense by a man whom Mr Thrasher had highly recommended. "'Don't you worry, Mrs. D. I'll set you up with the finest bathroom renovator in town. He can transform a pig's ear into a silk purse. You won't recognise your bathroom any more.' It was true. It was hard to believe that the old bathroom, much like Chloe, had undergone a miraculous metamorphosis. It was horrifying to discover in the old pipes there had been a huge pile of hair that had been stuck there, possibly hair belonging to people going back for generations that had bathed in that bath. It had been the size of a football. The thought had made Chloe squirm in disgust, but the new bathroom was so magnificent. She could stare at it all day if given the opportunity. She moved very clandestinely towards the bathroom cabinet, discreetly pulling out the fourth drawer where her mother stashed away all her medicines. The question was, what should she take? She examined the first bottle, reading the label, realising that this bottle contained powerful painkillers that the dentist had given her mother once, after a severe tooth infection that had caused her mother a grievous amount of pain. She opened the bottle, retrieving three pills, which she stuffed in her jean pocket. She found some Xanax and some tranquilizers in another bottle that had been prescribed to her mother when her grandfather Barry had died. She remembered how her mother had fallen apart after Barry's death, locking herself up in her bedroom for days on end. She was so distressed to lose her father. Chloe put three Xanax and two tranquilizers in her pocket, 
She came across another prescription bottle and had no idea what the pills were used for, but she pocketed several of them anyway, and there was another painkiller for stomach spasms and indigestion. She put them into her jean pockets, jiggling them around first in her hands to inspect them more closely. Then she found a bottle of sleeping tablets. She undid the top, removing a couple of tablets and slipping them into her pocket. All of a sudden she heard her mother calling out at her from down the stairs. Chloe! Chloe, are you there, sweetheart? Your date has arrived. I'm coming, Mum. I won't be a second, she called out, hurriedly slamming the door closed and glancing at her reflection briefly in the mirror. These days she struggled to believe the once ugly school kid with the scattering of freckles across her nose and the bottled glasses that she used to wear was the same girl staring back at her in the mirror. She had to admit her transformation was as miraculous as the bathroom. Is that really me, she thought, staring back at the pretty blue eyes and buoyantly curly blonde hair that was reflected back at her in the mirror. Chloe, sweetheart, came her mother's voice. Lennox is here. Don't keep him waiting, will you? Hurry up, dear. Chloe began to panic. If her mother caught her snooping around the brand new bathroom, she'd not be best pleased. Chloe tiptoed out of the bathroom very discreetly and hurriedly dashed down the long staircase, where Lennox Miller was waiting for her, with an appreciative grin on his face. He gave her a wink. Wow, you look amazing, Chloe, he said, glancing at her approvingly, at the smart designer jeans she was wearing, along with the elegant silver tank top. You look pretty cool yourself, said Chloe shyly. Oh, this old thing, said Lennox. It belonged to my older brother, but I like the logo. That's why I wear it. Chloe secretly thought Lennox would look good with a sack of potatoes over his head, but she said nothing. Chloe's mother glanced briefly at her watch and then at Chloe. When will you be back? she asked her daughter. I'll be back by twelve o'clock sharp, Chloe assured her mother. The party lasts until midnight. Well, take these keys, will you, dear? Let yourself in. And don't be noisy, because me and your father, we want to have an early night tonight. So take care not to make a huge rattle when you climb up the staircase. Wilbur the Rhodesian Ridgeback was enthusiastically bounding around Lennox and jumping up on his shirt. I think Wilbur approves of the designer logo on your shirt, said Chloe giggling. Get down, Wilbur, will you? said Mrs. Dyer. Oh, I do apologise, Lennox. This dog is so out of control sometimes. But I do think he likes you a lot. He's not usually all over people like this. Normally, he's actually quite a well-behaved dog. Don't worry, said Lennox. I love dogs, Mrs. Dyer. He probably can smell my dogs I've got at home. I've got three of them, you know. Chloe's mother stood in the doorway, calling after her daughter. Have a good time, my darling. Don't do anything I wouldn't do, which means you can almost do anything, she teased. Don't forget to be back by twelve. Your mum's so cool, said Lennox. I really like her. Once they were both sitting in Lennox's gold BMW. I now know where you get your good looks from, Chloe. Thanks, she said, blushing. So what did you get? asked Lennox excitedly, looking at Chloe with an expectant expression on his face. Chloe pulled out over a dozen pills from her pocket, laying them out flat on the palm of her hand to show him. He studied the pills closely and smiled. Good girl, you did well. Well, they're painkillers here, anti-anxiety stuff, and possible sleeping medication as well, along with an assortment of other pills. This is what you wanted, isn't it? It's exactly what I wanted, said Lennox with a chuckle. Chloe looked at Lennox intently. Are you sure your friends will be all right with me coming to this party? Of course, you silly mutt, he said, tweaking her nose affectionately. You're my girlfriend, aren't you? We've been dating for three weeks already. Chloe's chest swelled with pride. It felt good to hear Lennox call her his girlfriend. It made her feel remarkably important that she was dating the most popular well-liked boy in the entire school. But Chloe liked him, because although he was fancied by all the girls, he never let it get to his head, unlike Lucinda Callister, who thought she was all that, which made her infinitely less attractive. In Chloe's humble opinion, there was a genuine warm side to Lennox Miller. 
I'm just nervous, she admitted candidly. This is the first pill-popping party I've ever been to. I guess I just don't know what to expect. Of course she'd heard about such parties from some of the girls at school, when she'd longed to be part of the in-crowd, but now with Lennox a senior and a hottie to boot, she was well on her way to being considered one of the cool kids at school. It didn't get better than that, and Chloe could not wipe the happy, contented smile off her face. Lennox drove away down the streets of their green leafy Portland neighbourhood. He glanced at her with appreciative eyes. "'What is the big smile for?' he asked her gingerly. "'I don't know. I'm just happy to be here with you,' she said. "'You know, Chloe, I'll tell you what I like about you,' he told her. "'You're not an airhead. You're rarely pretty, but you've got some substance. That's what my mother calls it,' he laughed. "'She tells me some of the girls I've dated in the past are like teddy bears without any stuffing.' "'Really?' said Chloe. "'What did she think of Lucinda Callister, then? You dated her for long enough, didn't you?' Lucinda, he said, rolling his eyes. That girl! Oh, my God, what did I ever see in her? She's so full of herself, unlike you. I doubt I'll ever be full of myself, Chloe confided. Whenever I look at myself in the mirror, I see myself as I was, with those awful bottle glasses that I used to wear, those dreadful braces, and I was a little overweight. It was Lucinda who made me get fit and cut back on the calories, because she told me once... I looked six months pregnant. Lennox whistled. That was never true. You never looked six months pregnant. You might have had a bit of puppy fat, but that was all. Girls can be cruel, he said. My God, I was an idiot to go out with such a snake in the grass. Anyway, let's get going to the party, shall we? The last thing I want to do is to be talking about that awful girl, Lucinda Callister. There's so many more positive things to think of. "'It's going to be an absolute bore. "'We're going to have a blast,' he assured Chloe, "'giving her hand an encouraging squeeze. "'The only setback, it's an hour's drive from Portland. "'You know Kelly Carpenter?' Chloe nodded. "'Well, her parents are away, "'and the barn they have on their sizable property "'is often hired out for wedding venues. "'So it's kitted out with chairs and tables, everything we need. "'So we're having the party there. "'Oh, it's going to be amazing.' If her parents knew about it, they'd probably have kittens. But you know what they say. While the cat's away, the mice do play, he chuckled. Chloe was not sure what was expected of her at a pill-popping party, and didn't really fancy popping people's prescription tablets. But what was the harm in that? If the pills had been prescribed by doctors, they should be safe to take surely. Unlike the notoriously unreliable pills you could buy from unscrupulous, rather sketchy, reckless drug dealers who did not care a jot about the safety of the drugs they supplied their patrons. The untrustworthy source of those pills could be very questionable at the best of times, but at this party that Chloe was attending tonight with Lennox, it was not like that. They would certainly not be knocking back unorthodox concoctions like ayahuasca, GHB hallucinogens, heroin, cocaine, or even depressants, which was a monumental relief for Chloe. Lennox put on some music to entertain them in the car, and occasionally reached out his large hand to give her leg an encouraging squeeze. Both of them bobbed their bodies happily to the music, and when they knew the words of a song, they'd sing along. The female voice of the GPS directed them to turn left at the next 1,800 metres, and at the junction and then to turn right again at the next stop sign. Soon they drifted along unfamiliar craggy roads, pitted with potholes that became rocky and tumultuous, as they abandoned the asphalt and embraced roads that were a lot more precarious to navigate, so that the gold BMW whipped up tiny stones in the roads that beat and scratched the undercarriage of the car that wobbled and shook like a cranky, capricious old man. By all accounts, they had two near misses, when on two separate occasions Lennox nearly ploughed straight into a deer with long antlers rocketing past the car at a furious speed, its dark eyes staring in at them, making Chloe recoil in horror. "'They should warn drivers,' said Lennox, sounding annoyed, "'that they're deer here are crossing the roads. I dare say there's been a lot of roadkill along these roads, which would have been avoided if the authorities around here were a lot more scrupulous about warning people.' It was a pretty night, Chloe had to admit that, 
although the weather could have been a lot more convivial. She always found in Portland that the summer could have so many false starts. It could be a bit like Montana in that regard. You could have eighty-degree weather, and then it would sometimes drop to freezing. Some people said that the spring wasn't over yet, but all the trees had abandoned their blossoms and were wearing plentiful leaves, so Chloe was certain it was supposed to be summer. But even in the car she could feel the notable chill in the air, and was secretly wishing with all her heart that she'd brought a jacket along with her for the ride. She felt ever so slightly rattled, rather unnerved, about their near run-in with a deer, as if in some way it was an inauspicious warning sign, about the evening that lay ahead of them, the script yet to be written. Did not bad things happen in threes? What could go wrong next, she thought. She shivered not with the cold, but with an ominous feeling that hung over her, like an extra coat that she could not shake off, as if deep down in her gut she sensed something bad would happen. No, she was being silly, of course she was. But then again, was she? Even the infirmament was casting out its signs, like laying down the cards in a game of poker, and right now it didn't look like the knight was dealing out a very good hand. The pearly moon that moments before had smiled down at them with a promising silvery shine was now ominously covered by a foggy cloud cover, and even the stars seemed to have recoiled by burying themselves beneath this misty veil. They travelled down these sequestered unfriendly roads, where the light had grown significantly dimmer and the night much more tenebrific, with dark, ambiguous, very obscure shadows looming furtively through the trees like disembodied ghosts. Even with Lennox by her side, Chloe felt terribly alone, as she tried desperately to sound upbeat when she talked to him, to iron away the looming sense of doubt that was holding her to ransom tonight, with a powerful sense of foreboding. As if Lennox could mind-read, he tried to lift the stony silence away, like a heavy stone, by lightening the mood. "'I can sense you're a little nervous, Chloe, about the party tonight.' "'But it's going to be just fine, I promise you. "'I'll make sure I look after you. "'You're my girlfriend, after all. "'For goodness sake, don't look so worried. "'You look so tense. "'I've got half a mind to abandon this party, "'take you somewhere else. "'You just look so worried. "'I'm sorry. "'I guess I'm just a little apprehensive, that's all. "'I'm just being silly.' "'You're not silly. "'Let me tell you about the party,' said Lennox. "'so that you know we all bring alcohol along with us. "'I've got stuff in the trunk of the car, "'which we hand in when we arrive, and some snacks. "'There'll be a big bowl where we put the pills in it, "'and we mix them up. "'You can take a small handful, about five or six pills, "'knock them back, and wait for the high to come. "'Sometimes the pills, well, they're duds, they don't work. "'But that's part of the fun, isn't it? "'You wait to see what happens.' Soon they had arrived at the party, and Lennox parked his car next to many other impressive-looking cars. It was clear some of these teenagers had money, but among the congregations of cars were some more modest-looking vehicles that you might expect a teenager to own. There were groups of young people moving towards the renovated barn, all looking ebulliently excited about the evening that lay ahead. All were wearing trendy jeans, sneakers, and sweatshirts and you could hear the pounding, throbbing music from the barn. Chloe knew that the DJ was a boy called Clark, who would provide all the music for the party. His father was a professional DJ, so he had all the right equipment and lighting, the quintessential ingredients for a great party. Lennox opened the car door for Chloe, and when the fresh air nudged her neck, she let out a cold shiver, and Lennox, on seeing how freezing she was, said to her, "'It's a little nippy for summer, I'm afraid.' He pulled out a jacket from the trunk of his car. "'Here, put this on before you catch your death of cold.' Chloe was so grateful to sink her arms in Lennox's oversized, very warm jacket that smelt of his aftershave, and she was grateful for its shielding warmth. Lennox grabbed an ice cooler rather gingerly in one hand, and together they walked hand in hand together to the party. The lively, effervescent, rather dynamic music was pumping away passionately through the night, charging the air with a peppery kinetic atmosphere, with a spirited frisky energy that seemed to invite people to dance and abandon all their inhibitions. People were becoming animated fast, liberally knocking back alcohol in plastic cups, 
and laughing, sometimes quite raucously. One jaunty woman was cackling like a witch. Then there, on a central table, was a large purple glass bowl, with a sign on the side which read, The Lucky Dip, Receive Your Free Flight to the Moon. People were adventurously helping themselves to medications, knocking them back like smarties, with no restraint. Clary reluctantly took four pills, with a vacillating hesitancy, her fingers trembling, while she knocked the pills back with a cup of vodka and lemonade. The pills got awkwardly lodged in the back of her throat, but on the second sip of her drink, they regretfully went down. Lennox took about six pills, then he swept Chloe up in his arms, with a spirited swing, and they danced together for a while. "'We've done it,' he whispered to her, giving her a squeeze. "'Now we wait and see if we got lucky tonight.' Chloe clung to Lennox like a limpet. She was fearful about what she might be about to experience. So far the not knowing was no fun at all, and she clandestinely privately hoped that the pills she had taken were just duds. After about half an hour into the party, some people were violently sick, throwing up the contents of their stomach, so that the insufferable sickly stench in the barn was very oppressive and unwholesome. Others were so bladdered they were dancing around wildly, with their inhibitions thrown to the wind. One girl had flung off all her clothes, and was dancing on a table-top completely naked, as if she was in a stripper's bar, and some people were cheering her on. Another young man threw off his clothes, and the two of them were twirling around on the table, unabashedly. Others were lying passed out, like people you often see in airport lounges. Before long, both Lennox and Chloe, holding hands, went to sit on an old haystack, there had been haystacks dotted and distributed all around the long room, covered with blankets and cushions. That was when Lennox told her he didn't feel so good. "'My head is spinning a bit,' he said. In a trice, Chloe found herself feeling very strange herself. She didn't like this party one bit, and wished with all her heart she could be at home. If this was people's idea of a good time, then they were as mad as hatters for this was about as fun as sticking your head in a bowl of ice-cold water, or down the toilet. How could anyone describe this as fun? "'I want to go home,' she told Lennox pleadingly. "'Please, please take me home. I don't feel good either. My head is also spinning. I'm beginning to see stars.' Lennox appeared almost comatose. He was unresponsive, lying back on the haystack, apathetically unmoving. "'I want to go home, Lennox!' she said, poking him. Wake up, Lennox! Can you hear me? I don't feel good. I want to go home. I feel all wobbly and shaky. I'm scared, Lennox. I'm really scared. I'm not used to feeling like this. I can't feel my legs. Everything around me is spinning. Indeed, everything around her became ambiguously vague. People's dancing figures became obscure and contorted. Features lost definition. The darkness moved together in a long sweeping curtain that began to steal the light away from Chloe's eyes, and very suddenly, against the throb of the wild music and the excitable screams of inebriated people, Chloe blacked out. On several occasions she managed to wake up out of the hazy fog that surrounded her, like a dark wall hemming her in. She poked Lennox, trying to wake him up, but he was out cold and didn't even appear to flinch. Lennox, wake up, please wake up, she said, shaking him. But he failed to respond, and Chloe would drop away like a rose petal, falling onto the ground, and drift off into an alternative world. She kept slipping in and out of consciousness, unable to discern what was real and what was not. She floated between two worlds. At one point she heard hushed whispers, and what seemed like a disembodied conversation, where the people appeared to be very overwrought, but it seemed so dreamlike, so surreal. She felt insouciant towards the impressions that were painted in her mind, for she seemed to be caught up on a cloud of apathetic dispassion. What the hell are we going to do? He's bloody dead! He's bloody dead! I don't want to get into trouble. You have no idea what my parents are capable of doing to me. We have to get rid of this body. If my parents knew I'd hosted this party in the barn, they'd kill me. We need to do something. It must have been several hours later 
that Chloe woke up to find herself all alone in the barn, lying on a haystack with her purse on the straw by her side. Empty bottles lay strewn around all over the place, but beyond that she was the only person in the barn. The place stank of vomit and urine, and there were blankets and cushions scattered liberally all over the floor, along with cigarette butts. Where were all these people? And more to the point, where was Lennox? Regretfully her head was still spinning, but at least she could see her surroundings clearly. When she realised there was not a soul around, she hurriedly phoned her best friend Whitney, who was still considered one of the outcasts at her school. But Chloe knew she could trust Whitney with some of her deepest secrets. The girl was loyal to a fault, the kind of friend you could always depend on. With fingers trembling, a throbbing thunderous headache, and the taste of nausea on her tongue, Chloe dialed her friend's number. Please, Whitney, please answer for God's sake. The time was six o'clock. She hoped her friend would answer at this insanely early hour of the morning. Whitney did answer the phone. Her voice sounded bright and breezy. She didn't sound like someone who'd been sleeping for very long. I can't believe you're phoning me this early, Chloe. You must have had a great time last night. How is lover boy? How did the party go? She asked obsequiously. I'm dying to hear all the details. No one's ever invited me to a pill-popping party before. You are so, so lucky, Chloe. I envy you so much. Oh, my God, did you get high? True to form, Whitney had a habit of asking a plethora of questions without waiting for the answer, as she was overwrought with an eager enthusiasm to know everything. Listen to me, Whitney. I need your help, said Chloe. I need you to get here fast before my parents discover I'm not in bed. They will kill me. I mean that literally, Whitney, if they discover I'm not home. My mother will literally ground me for weeks. You have to pick me up now. Take me home. I'll never hear the end of it otherwise. I'll be in the doghouse for weeks. You're not still at the party, asked Whitney incredulously. She whistled. That must have been some party, if you're only leaving now. But I don't understand. Where is Lennox? Wasn't he supposed to bring you back home? Yes, he was, but I don't know where he is. Everybody's evacuated the party, Whitney. No one is here. I'm all on my own. Lennox and his car are nowhere to be seen. Everybody has vanished. I'm just here on my own and it's freaking me the hell out. Please get here quickly. You're alone? That's insane. My God, that is so terrible. Why did Lennox not bring you home? You didn't have a fallout with him, did you? Whereabouts are you exactly? I'm here at a barn in Port... Well, an hour away from Portland, to be precise. I think the place belongs to Kelly Carpenter's parents. The barn is used for wedding venues. It's called Misty Hills, I believe. I do know that they advertise on the wedding websites. I'm not sure where it is, but please will you pick me up outside the barn? It'll take you a good hour to get here. I know Clark knows where the venue is. He was playing the disco music last night. He'd have an address. And as for Lennox, no, we haven't fallen out. I just don't know where he is. All right, all right, calm down, Chloe. You sound absolutely frantic. Keep your hair on. I'll be with you as soon as I can, I promise. Before long, Whitney had managed to pick up her friend, having found the address of the wedding venue online. And using her GPS, she had located the barn known as Misty Hills. It was certainly an idyllic location, with an exquisite lake and a plethora of trees. But what was not idyllic was the state of her friend. Whitney physically gasped when she saw Chloe's ashen face. She looked green at the gills. She led her friend back to the car, curbing her urgent need to bombard her with questions. She knew her friend was not in a good way, and stopped at a service station to pick up ginger cookies and ale for her friend. Chloe drank back the ginger ale and ate a couple of ginger cookies, and it seemed to quell the insatiable nausea rising up in the back of her throat. "'What the hell happened to you?' asked Whitney, when she noticed some pink colour returning to Chloe's cheeks. "'If you don't mind my saying, Chloe, you look like death warmed up. You really do. Your eyes are like sunken hollows, and your face is all puffy. 
Whitney focused intently on her friend. And where the hell did Lennox get to? I thought he was a perfect gentleman. It's unlike him to abandon you like that. That guy has some explaining to do. You're going out and he drops you like a hot potato and leaves you at the party. What the hell is wrong with him? Who does that? I really liked him, Chloe. But the fact that he did this to you makes me highly doubt his integrity. Don't be mean about him, Whitney. You don't know what you're talking about. I'm sure he has his reasons for abandoning me. Don't jump to conclusions. He wasn't in a good way either, said Chloe. I couldn't even wake him up myself. He was out cold last night. I think the pills we took made us feel all funny. I barely even remember that party. People were dancing. Some appeared to be having a good time. Others were getting violently sick, and others passing out. It was so horrible. My God! And to think that I was actually envying you. I thought you'd hit the jackpot. But all you got was a bunch of brass farthings coming out of an inauspicious slot machine. What a bummer. That really sucks. I better get you home, said Whitney, before your parents give you hell. You need to drop me a couple of doors down, outside that red brick terrace house that belongs to the Donahues. You know the one. I'll walk the rest of the way. It's not far. I'll clandestinely sneak into our house as quietly as I can. If you drive up to the front door, you will wake up Wilbur and then the entire household. And if my mother gets wind that I returned home at this late hour, my life will literally not be worth living. I promise you, Whitney, you do not want to see my mother. When she gets a bee in her bonnet about something, she'll sulk for days on end if she knows I've let her down. You do surprise me. I thought your mother was so easy going, so cool, so relaxed. Not always where I'm concerned. You've got her wrong there. Chloe thanked her friend for dropping her outside the Donahue house, and stealthily, like a cougar on the prowl, made her way to her parents' home, surreptitiously plundering the key in the lock and creeping down the long passageway up the staircase to her bedroom. And the moment she saw her cosy bed, she fell back flat on her back, groaning in appreciation, and was soon out like a light. When Sheila Dyer woke up from her blissfully pleasant, rather invigorating sleep, she glanced briefly at her bedside clock. It was nine o'clock in the morning, and her husband's side of the bed was cold. She knew he'd likely taken Wilbur for a walk at the local park, which he was inclined to do over the weekends. It was so good to have a sleep in. She wondered how her daughter's party had gone. She smiled contentedly to herself, for in recent months her daughter Chloe had blossomed from a rosebud into a rose. She hadn't failed to notice her daughter's confidence growing in leaps and bounds since her braces were removed and her ugly glasses had been replaced by contact lenses. Even more phenomenal was that her daughter had shed all her puppy fat and had become a junior cheerleader after rigidly sticking to a healthy diet in which she had lost a significant amount of weight. Chloe had been dating Lennox Miller, who was the most popular boy in school, and Sheila was surprised that her daughter was bewildered that Lennox could even like her. How could her daughter have so little self-assurance? Did she not realise how beautiful she was? I cannot believe he likes me, Mum, Chloe had said incredulously. I mean, he could have any girl in school he wants, and he chooses me. I can't believe it. Why wouldn't he choose you, Chloe, dear? asked her father, looking at Chloe over the paper he was reading. That boy is very lucky to be dating you, Chloe. And don't you forget that for a minute. You should be the one choosing what boys to date, not the other way round. Thanks, Dad, said Chloe, making a face. You're entitled to be biased because you're my father. But they're girls at school, I promise you, that are a lot prettier than I am. I doubt that very much, Chloe, her father had said gingerly. Why do you keep putting yourself down like this? I don't like it at all. Besides, men are not as visual as you think they are. Whoever said that is talking bulldash. Indeed, I think it's the other way round. Women are more visual than men and far more critical to boot. Ask any man. We're looking for more than just a pretty face in a woman. 
We like a woman that makes us laugh and whose company we thoroughly enjoy. Look at your mother. She's beautiful. But I hate to say this. I'd have lost interest in her a long time ago if she wasn't fun to be around. People want to hang around people they enjoy being with. You would do well to remember that. We live in a world where people put far too much emphasis on the physical appearance. And in truth, that is deceptively shallow, for that is not what holds a relationship together. Ask your mother about that. Your father's absolutely right, Chloe, her mother had said. A pretty face, it helps, but it's not good enough in a long-standing relationship. Look at all the celebrity marriages. They keep failing. And why? It's personality conflicts. Good looks are not going to glue a relationship together. It's impossible for that to happen. Superficial foundations are never enduring. Everybody knows that. And if they don't, they're not very bright. I hope you're right, Mum, said Chloe. I do want to believe that Lennox likes me for me, and not just because of my face. Chloe's mother climbed out of bed, washed her face, brushed her teeth, and put on a cool summer dress and a cashmere sweater. As even though it was supposed to be summer, there was a discernible chilly nip in the air. She was eager to find out how Chloe's party had been, but when she creaked open her daughter's bedroom door and peered inside, she noticed Chloe was sound asleep. It looked like she'd gone to bed in all her clothes. She must be shattered, Sheila thought. Poor thing. She took on more than she could chew last night with that late-night party of hers. I'll leave her to sleep in. She trotted nonchalantly down the staircase to hear the sound of her husband's car engine backing in the driveway as he parked. Wilbur bounded happily out of the passenger side door of his white Honda. Sheila smiled when she saw her husband climbing out of the car with a brown paper bag and a newspaper in his hand. She knew he had taken Wilbur for a walk in the park and popped off at the bakery to buy some croissants and some quiche for breakfast. It was so typical of her husband to be so considerate. "'Where is Chloe?' asked Mr. Dyer. As his wife placed the croissants on a tray and threw them carefully into the oven to warm up. "'I think we should leave her be, sweetheart,' said Sheila Dyer. "'Do you know she went to bed in all her clothes? "'I think that must have been some party she had last night. "'She's clearly not used to dancing the night away. "'She's completely exhausted. "'I'm glad I'm not that age any more,' said her husband, "'settling happily into the chair around the kitchen table "'and opening out the newspaper. "'I think kids have it a lot harder these days, "'with all that pressure from social media. "'I'm glad I wasn't born in this generation.' I'd have hated all that. Me too, my darling, said Mrs. Dyer. I am so glad I was not born in this generation. She nodded in agreement. It was at three o'clock in the afternoon that a police car rolled up outside the Dyer residence. Chloe had still not made an appearance from her bedroom, but Sheila Dyer knew very well that teenagers, if given the chance, would happily sleep their life away. She peered out of the living room window that overlooked the front yard and, of course, the driveway. She and her husband had been thoroughly enjoying some afternoon tea together, and both of them were reading detective novels. It's the police, she said to her husband. What the hell are they doing at our house? Two rather solemn-looking plainclothes officers were knocking at the dyer's front door. <coughs> a man and a woman. I better go and answer that, said Mrs. Dyer, shaking her head. Why do they have to disturb us on a Sunday? Soon she led them into the living room, insisting that they both took a seat, which they did rather reluctantly. Sheila Dyer noticed that both of the officers seemed unusually twitchy, as if they were extremely troubled about something, and were trying their damnedest to look calm and collected, with very little success. The man appeared to be in his early forties, and was wearing a Burberry raincoat over his clothes, which wasn't remotely surprising as the overcast weather had been drizzling with rain all day. The man looked unusually sombre, as if he was carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders. But Sheila secretly suspected he always looked like that, the kind of person who took life far too seriously. The creases around his steely grey eyes suggested that he worried an awful lot, but he had the kind of square physique and strong shoulders, 
that gave you a sense you would always feel safe in his company. The younger officer, Sally, was a very sensible-looking young lady. She wore no makeup, had olive skin and brown curious eyes, and wore her hair back in a slick ponytail. Everything about her was sensible, including the brogue she was wearing on her feet. She was wearing black cotton pants that flared at the bottom, and a tight-fitting black jacket. "'Ma'am,' said the officer, "'my name is Detective Leonard Kingsley, and this is Detective Sally Bale. "'I'm wondering if I might have a word with your daughter, Chloe. "'It is of the utmost importance we speak to her now.' "'What is this about, officer?' asked Mr. Dyer, growing increasingly concerned. "'He pulled the glasses off his face to stare at the officer squarely. "'It's concerning the party she attended last night.' "'I understand she was taken to the party by a Lennox Miller. "'Is that right?' "'That's right, officer,' said Sheila Dyer gingerly. "'I'm afraid Chloe is fast asleep right now. "'I think that was quite some party she had last night. "'She's totally exhausted, but I'll go and wake her up right now. "'I would be most obliged, ma'am. I appreciate it.' "'Moments later, a disheveled-looking Chloe, with flyaway frizzy hair, that looked as if it had been through a feisty windstorm, and a complexion so white she appeared to look ghost-like, was led into the living room by her mother. Her heart was pounding a dime to a dozen. Her palms were sweating profusely. Why would a detective want to speak to her, of all people? What would Lennox think if she blabbed about the pill-popping party? Worse still, what would her parents think if they unveiled the truth of what she'd been up to last night? If they were to find out a whisper of the fact that she'd been popping pills of any kind, they would be absolutely mortified. Her father abhorred drugs, but maybe he wouldn't be quite so offended by prescription medications, but she couldn't be sure. After all, they had been prescribed by a doctor. They'd obviously be harmless. She had sworn to Lennox she wouldn't tell anyone about these private parties and about the pill popping. She felt rather annoyed and let down by Lennox, for leaving the party without her, but no doubt he'd have a credible explanation for what had transpired that evening. He had been in a bad way when she saw him last. He must have taken a powerful sedative tablet, because she had not been able to wake him up. Yes, it was unlike him to abandon her at the party, but maybe he was feeling so poorly he'd forgotten all about her. She could forgive him for that. It had been mortifying to wake up on that haystack alone after everyone had left the party and having to call up her best friend Whitney to ask for help. She felt horribly alone in that barn after the party, surrounded by the smell of vomit and empty bottles of alcohol strewn haphazardly all over the place. She shuddered as she thought about what the detective would ask her. Chloe was adverse to lying, but she would do it to protect Lennox. She'd do anything for that boy. She liked him a lot, and she knew he felt the same way about her. "'Chloe, my love, this is Detective Leonard Kingsley,' said her mother. "'He's here today to make some inquiries about the party you attended last night with Lennox. "'He just wants to ask you some questions, that's all.' "'Chloe's eyes grew wide like saucers, and Detective Kingsley could see the fear in their depths, "'as she twiddled her fingers awkwardly, and in a quiet whisper said, "'Yes? What about the party?' "'On seeing Detective Kingsley, it did not escape Chloe's attention.' that this man with the discerning sharp eyes that studied her reactions beadily would not easily be fooled or fobbed off. Chloe was certain he could spot a liar, quicker than her father would spot a math mistake, and that meant he was on the ball with his game, which made her feel ever so slightly intimidated. She tried to appear nonchalant and vague, but the throbbing headache she'd inherited from last night's party hammered away against her temple and the back of her eyes like an ice pick. She had never experienced a throbbing headache like this before. This must be the famous migraine headaches her mother had drawn reference to over the years, declaring them on one occasion as being the headaches that were so bad you could actually be hospitalised from them. Believe me, Chloe, her mother had told her, when you get a migraine headache like that, you want the ground to swallow you whole. Chloe wanted the ground to swallow her whole right now not only because of her headache, but because of these predatory inspectors coming to her home to ask awkward questions. 
their obtrusive, unwelcome presence in her family living room on this gloomy, rather bleak, wet afternoon left her feeling as deflated as an inflatable floating toy on a pool that had lost all its air. It had made it even harder for her to forget the party from last night. Its memory, however vague and distorted, stuck to her like a tick to a dog's coat. She squinted awkwardly in the bright light of the living room, as her eyes had been used to sleeping in a dark room, and tried to adjust to the change of light in her environment. Detective Kingsley and his female companion, along with his parents, were sitting on different sofa chairs spread out through the living room, staring at her with an air of expectation on their faces, as if somehow she'd have all the answers to their questions, whatever the hell they were. I understand, Miss Dyer, that your boyfriend, Lennox Miller, took you to a party at Misty Hills last night. Did he bring you back after the party to your parents' house? Chloe felt the bile rising up the back of her throat. She felt as if she wanted to throw up the contents of her stomach. She took in a deep breath and said timidly, Of course he dropped me back here last night, at midnight. That's right, he dropped me back here. You see, Miss Dyer, we are doing a missing persons investigation. Leonard Miller has gone missing. You were the last person to be seen with him. So you say he dropped you off at midnight. Chloe's face reddened. It seemed that she was lost for words, opening and closing her mouth like a goldfish. Missing, she said gingerly. I, I, I don't understand. Uh, we were together last night at the party. Uh, we were together. You see, Miss Dyer, Lennox never returned to his home last night. But that doesn't make any sense. I, I, I don't understand. Miss Dyer. We know all about the illegal party held at Misty Hills by Kelly Carpenter while her parents were away. We know this because this morning one unfortunate young lady went into cardiac arrest and was taken urgently to hospital, said the detective. She's very lucky to be alive and is currently gravely ill in hospital. Oh, my goodness! Cardiac arrest! said Mrs. Dyer, gasping. You're telling me, detective, that a young girl went into cardiac arrest at a party that my girl attended last night. There must be a dreadful mistake. Teenagers don't have heart attacks. I'm afraid they can have heart attacks, Mrs. Dyer, if they put their lives in jeopardy, which many foolish teenagers did last night. The party your daughter attended last night was a pill-popping party, Mrs. Dyer, and the kids tend to take all manner of prescription medications that they steal from their family and friends. They pop these medications at parties in the hope that they will experience a high. It has recently become a popular trend, I'm afraid, sometimes with very deadly consequences. Last month a young man died from a party like this in Houston, Texas, he had high blood pressure, medications in his bloodstream, antidepressants and tranquilizers, along with sleeping pills. He was found dead at that party, floating on the swimming pool. But he wasn't dead from drowning. He died from the intoxication and the mix of these drugs with alcohol. Chloe, is this true? asked her father, his voice sounding cracked. Did you go to a pill-popping party last night? Chloe stood there, growing red in the face. She started to bite her nail awkwardly, pulling away the skin from its folds. Uh, um... Chloe, you did not take any tablets last night, did you? You would not be so carelessly stupid, would you? Came the stern voice of her father. I think we've talked about drugs enough in this household of ours. I've warned you on the dangers. You were not taking pills, were you, Chloe? Uh, of, of course not, said Chloe, trembling. I, I didn't take any pills, she lied. I, I wouldn't do that. This is very important, and I want you to think clearly. Did Lennox take any pills, Chloe? It's very important that you can remember, asked the detective. 
Chloe nodded. I think he did. Yes, he did, she confessed, realising suddenly that lying about what Lennox had taken might impede the police investigation. And what if the tablets had genuinely harmed him? Last time she remembered poking him, he had been out cold. Now I want you to think, Chloe. Did he take a green and purple tablet by any chance? Yes, yes he did, actually. I think he took two of them. If he took these tablets, Miss Dyer, I put it to you he would not have been able to take you home in his car. If he took those tablets, he would definitely have blacked out. One of those tablets could knock out a rhino. And if Lennox took two of these things, he would have been out cold. Chloe bit her lip, so very hard that the blood spurted into her mouth. She grimaced, restraining herself from telling a lie, although every part of her was persuading her to do just that. A little persuasive voice was jabbing itself in her head, saying, You'll get into trouble. You'll get into trouble. Say nothing. Say nothing. Say you can't remember. Plead ignorance. There was a long, stoic silence as the two detectives studied Chloe closely. The very discerning Detective Kingsley could tell immediately that this young, rather well-raised girl was inwardly squirming. Her face was the colour of a beetroot. She was finding it very challenging to lie. It wouldn't be difficult to get the truth out of her. Unlike some hardened, belligerent teenagers he was well acquainted with that were as difficult to crack open as a hard-boiled egg. Look, I understand this is extremely difficult for you, Miss Dyer, he said obsequiously. This is a very serious missing persons investigation. You need to be completely honest with us. You're obliged as a responsible American citizen for the interest of your friends to tell us exactly what you remember about the party you attended. I don't want you to protect anyone. That is highly dangerous. It's not the kind of game I recommend you play. It can have far-reaching consequences. You need to realise that this concerns the safety of your friend. So you must tell us absolutely everything you know, and don't leave anything out. Let me tell you this for nothing, young lady. Lennox's life could be in grave danger if we don't find him soon, based on what he has taken. If you hold back any vital information... It will have long-lasting ramifications, and I am quite sure you don't want to have that burning your conscience, knowing that your failure to tell us the truth meant someone was left in a bad way. Chloe, on perceiving the gravity of this very difficult situation, and hearing the detective's ominous words, began to cry. Tears spilled down her cheeks. I'm, I'm really sorry, detective. Um, I lied to you. I, I did take some tablets myself. It was because everybody was doing it. I thought it would be safe. You know, they're prescription medications. They're authorised by doctors. I didn't think they'd have any side effects. Miss Dyer, some of the pills authorised by doctors can be highly dangerous if they're taken by the wrong person, said the inspector. I'm surprised a very intelligent, savvy young girl like yourself does not realise that. Some prescription medications can be deadly. It depends, Miss Dyer. It depends on alcohol. It depends on how much is taken. It depends on what kind of medication is taken. I want you to tell me about the party that you attended from start to finish. Do you think you can do that for me, Miss Dyer? Chloe nodded, her expression sullen. Her puffy, tired eyes looked lugubriously sorrowful. Just so you know, Chloe, we are not cross with you, came Mr. Dyer's warm, reassuring voice. We've been young once ourselves. We've all made mistakes that we regret. I was once caught smoking pot in my father's shed, when pot was illegal in every state. I did it because of peer pressure. We've all been there and done that. So don't be embarrassed. Tell Detective Kingsley everything you know. You are not in trouble. We shall not be grounding you. You made a mistake. Mistakes are forgivable. 
But what is unforgivable is not doing the right thing. So telling the truth is imperative. The police need to find Lennox's whereabouts. Do you understand that, Chloe? The sooner they can find him, the more likely they can help him. Imagine what his poor parents are going through. They must be beside themselves with worry. Chloe nodded. Well, Lennox picked me up from the party. We arrived there and everything was buzzing. There was alcohol. People were smoking weed and cigarettes. There was music blasting away, people dancing. There was a bowl of pills in a glass purple bowl. People helped themselves to it. Soon afterwards, some people got violently sick. Others passed out. Some went wild. There was one girl. She was dancing on the table completely naked. Her name's Lydia Eaton. She's one of the shyest, most bashful people I know. So to see her behaving like that was so strange, so idiosyncratic. I mean, at school, when we get changed for swimming, she hides in the closet. She doesn't want anyone to see her in a state of undress. She's very private and painfully shy. But on that table last night, she was behaving like a stripper. I've no idea what she took, but she was so intoxicated. And you say she just stripped, took all her clothes off? Yes, said Chloe. She stripped off all her clothes and began dancing. I felt so sorry for her because I can't imagine how she's going to feel when she's sober and she sees what she did, especially if someone was videotaping her. And I rather suspect that they were. Everyone was cheering and another young man, he got up onto the table and took off all his clothes. He did exactly the same thing. I guess he must have taken a similar medication to her. I think she will be so mortified if people put down her behaviour on social media. Some people were enjoying themselves at the party, but it was a deadbeat party. The pill-popping wasn't a success as far as I'm concerned. I know I would never do it again. And you, Miss Dyer, what were you doing? Well, after me and Lennox had swallowed some tablets, we went to get some rum and coke and some vodka and lemonade, and then we went to sit on a haystack. We were waiting and hoping for the pills to take effect. Lennox said if we were lucky, we would get high quite quickly. I've never been high before, Detective, and I kind of wanted to experience the euphoric rush that people talk about. But I was also nervous about it. But nothing happened to me, or Lennox. I guess we got dud pills. Well, that's what I thought at the time. There were haystacks all over the venue. As the previous weekend, the place had been hired out for a barn dance, I believe. They were incredibly comfortable, and the host, Kelly Carpenter, put blankets on the haystacks and lots and lots of cushions to make them ever so comfortable. It actually looked amazing, because it's a legitimate wedding venue. All of a sudden, I began to feel, you know, really, really crap. People's silhouettes became ambiguous and vague. I could barely see people any more. It was as if everything was growing black. My head was spinning and I was seeing stars. I wanted to go home. I tried to wake up Lennox, but he was out cold. He failed to respond when I poked him. Later on, I completely blacked out. I would wake up every now and then. I was aware of stuff going on around me, but I was kind of caught up in a trance, I think. Everyone, when I woke up, had left the party. I was completely on my own, and Lennox's car was nowhere to be seen. I automatically assumed he'd driven off without me, forgot all about me. What time was this when you woke up, Miss Dyer? It was about five o'clock in the morning. Nobody was there. Everyone had left the party. It was still reasonably dark outside, but the morning was breaking, if you know what I mean. I felt very scared to be all on my own. So how did you get home, Miss Dyer? I phoned my friend Whitney. She looked up the address online and came to pick me up at about six o'clock in the morning. I got home at half past seven. I slipped into the house, tiptoed into my bedroom so as not to wake up Mum and Dad. And then when I went to bed, I fell fast asleep. And Mum only woke me up a while ago when you arrived. I'd been asleep for many hours. I had absolutely no idea, Detective, that Lennox was missing. 
Is he going to be all right? Look, Miss Dyer, at this stage of our investigation, we don't know anything about the welfare of Lennox. But our priority is to find him and the state of his physical condition. It is, of course, of grave concern to us, especially now you have verified that he took those purple and green pills. That is extremely worrying. Mr. Dyer grimaced. If that ever happens again, Chloe, and you are in trouble of any kind, you need to phone me at once. I will always pick you up. I don't want you to ever forget that. Thanks, Dad. I will make sure I do that. So we establish, based on what you've told us, Miss Dyer, you don't know what became of Lennox Miller, said Detective Kinsley, rubbing his chin reflectively. I do have a blurry memory, Inspector, of people saying they thought he was dead. But I don't know if it was a dream or not. If Lennox didn't go home last night... Where is his car, Inspector? He drives a distinctive gold BMW. That is the interesting question, Miss Dyer, that has left us significantly befuddled. This morning, when we were searching for Lennox Miller, we did discover his car. His gold BMW had been hauled out of the lake on the Misty Hills property, not too far from the barn. It appeared the door had been yanked off the car. We have never seen anything like this before. To be able to yank a door of a car does require superhuman strength. It would seem that the car was in the lake at some point in time. It was pulled out of the lake by who or what I do not know. But I hasten to say Lennox was not in the car. The police divers have been unable to locate his body. But right now he is considered missing. We cannot locate his whereabouts, so we are very concerned and troubled. Certainly the tablets he has taken leave me even more concerned. If he is not found, the consequences of his fate could be deadly, especially if he hasn't vomited out that medication. If he had vomited out this medication, things would be a lot more promising. Chloe's mother paled. If you say his BMW was in the lake, surely his body would be in there. Supposing he's drowned? That is what we assumed at first, Mrs. Dyer. But the lake has been thoroughly searched. There is no sign of Lennox's body in the lake. We've had divers up there all morning. There is nothing in there apart from fish and all the stuff you'd expect to find in a lake. Which leaves me with three questions. Why was his car driven into the lake? Who hauled it out? And who pulled off the door? And where is Lennox Miller? Maybe someone took him to hospital, said Chloe's mother. There are no reports of a young man fitting Lennox's description being hospitalised anywhere. But thank you for your help, Miss Dyer, said the officer, rising to his feet. If you can think of anything else, he said, handing Chloe a card, please give that number a call. A detective said Chloe. Please, please tell me that Lennox is going to be all right. I don't want anything bad to happen to him. As I told you, those tablets he has taken are of grave concern. They could knock out a rhino. They are only given to people with very, very serious sleeping disorders. Oh my God, said Chloe's mother, cupping her hand over her mouth. And he's such a sweet boy. I hope nothing bad has happened to him. I'm so concerned about his welfare. Well, you know what they say, said the inspector. No news is good news. We need to pray that he'll be found safe and well. I'll get a prayer chain started at once with my church, said Mrs. Dyer. The Dyers soberly watched the two police inspectors walking away from their property and driving away in their police car. They were rather bemused and confounded over the strange turn of events for this was turning out to be a less than agreeable weekend, when the fate of a young man seemed to be lying precariously by a silver thread, and his whereabouts a complete mystery. Once Mr. Dyer had composed himself, he slowly turned around to his daughter and said, "'You are not in any trouble, Chloe. I am proud of the way you conducted yourself back there, and for being completely honest with Detective Kingsley and his female companion.' 
But don't you ever do something like that again. Do you have any idea how dangerous it is to take someone's prescription medications? It could easily have killed you. I'm sorry, Dad. I, I, I just guess I didn't think properly. That's the big problem, Chloe, said her father ruefully. You young people never think when it comes to drugs. You all have this insane notion that you're immortal, and if something bad happens, that it's not going to be you. But I've got news for you, young lady. It doesn't matter how young you are. Death is no respecter of persons, and it will take you if you're not diligent. So make sure that next time you think before you make a very rash decision that could entirely affect your life, or literally end it if you're not careful. I'm so sorry, Dad. I, I won't ever do it again. And even those pills, they just made me feel so ill. I'm glad to hear that, Chloe. I'm very pleased you didn't get a positive reaction from them. We'll just have to pray that Lennox will be found safe and well. But supposing he's dead, Dad? I'm sorry, Chloe. I hate to say this to you. But based on what Detective Kingsley told us, that is a real possibility. If one of those tablets could knock out a rhino, you may find that Lennox may not wake up ever again. I need to prepare you for such a possibility. Must you, sweetheart, put such dreadful ideas into Chloe's head? We don't know where Lennox is, and I'm quite sure he will be fine, and that they will find him. But what if they don't, Mum? And what if he is dead? Supposing Dad is right? We'll cross that bridge, sweetheart, when we come to it, won't we? But what I'd like to know is who managed to yank a gold BMW out of a leg? And what was it doing there in the first place? Chloe's mother began to flap around like a pigeon. I'm going to start up a prayer line at once. I'll phone as many people as I can. We need to all pray for Lennox's safe return. Lennox's account. I was very excited to be going out with Chloe Dyer. She was not just a pretty face. She was more than that, even though she was not aware of it, and that made her all the more special. I had noticed her a long time ago, as even with her braces and bottled glasses, there was something unique about her. But the day she sauntered into our school after having abandoned her glasses, her blue eyes just popped out, and I think in that moment when she crossed my path on the school playground, I knew I had to take this girl out. She was a stunner and there wasn't a boy in the school that didn't notice the radical transformation to her appearance. I heard some of the lads say, The ugly duckling has become a swan. But the truth is, Chloe was never ugly. She may have thought she was. And who would have blamed her for that? I certainly wouldn't feel attractive if I'd been forced to wear glasses and braces like she did. I certainly would challenge any girl in our school to look good in those. I'll never forget Chloe's face when I first asked her out. She was so surprised and bewildered, as if she could not believe I found her attractive. When I first took Chloe home to meet my parents for Sunday lunch the week before the pill-popping party, my mother said to me, "'That's the first girl you've actually brought home, Lennox, that has some substance. She's quite the keeper, she is.' My father had wholeheartedly agreed." I knew they were right, of course. I was young at the time, naive, and a working progress. But I had sagaciously deduced that you become a more attractive person if you've been down a few rabbit holes and dark, bumpy journeys down the road of life that had been more than a little tumultuous. Chloe had been through hell and back, being bullied for her braces, her glasses, and her weight, with a couple of spiteful, mean-spirited kids calling her fatty. Then there was that precocious, self-absorbed cheerleader Lucinda, asking her if she was pregnant. I mean, who does that? Lucinda had an unkind, very filthy mouth on her. My father disliked her from the moment he met her. She was tactless, insincere, ruthlessly uninhibited by that toxic tongue of hers that seemed to spout only poison. 
She was born with a silver spoon in her mouth, with a rich daddy who gave in to her every whim. As a result, her vain, glorious, arrogant, self-indulgent attitude was very unbecoming. I really believe when I started dating Chloe, all the boys were touched by a bit of the green-eyed monster. They knew there was so much more to Chloe than just good looks, because she was as gentle as a female doe. Suffice to say a few of my friends were a bit apprehensive about my inviting Chloe to a pill-popping party. How do you know you can trust her? What if she goes blabbing to Mummy and Daddy? People worry about that sort of thing when you go to a party like that, especially when you're introducing someone new to pill-popping. I unequivocally did not doubt for a second that I could completely trust Chloe. She was eager to come along to the party. She also believed her mother had some old prescription medications that could be used. Honestly, when I look back to what we did then, I think how could we have been so stupid, so naive, so ignorant, and so reckless? If I knew then what I knew now, I'd never have thought the practice was so benign. I was to learn later from my two very relieved parents, happy to find me alive. The prescription medications are one of the leading forms of death in the United States when doctors screw up a prescription and make a fatal mistake, which is why people need to always ensure that their meds are correct. Obstensively, having said all that, how much more dangerous is it to haphazardly take things that you have no concept of knowing what they contain? I learnt the grievously hard way not to play Russian roulette with my life that I could so easily have lost on that inauspiciously fateful night only because of one thing, I was a complete and utter fool. The pill-popping parties had been successful. On two separate occasions, I experienced an amazing buzz. I'm not sure what those medications were that I took at those parties, and frankly I don't want to know. That's the whole idea of the party, to see if you've hit the jackpot and end up getting that feeling of euphoria. Sometimes you don't get a reaction at all. But people enjoy themselves smoking pot and drinking a ton of alcohol. If the pills fail to work, at the very least you can get inebriated, for everybody is looking to receive that high. Some medications react with the alcohol, and people can get really sick, but it was a risk that everyone was prepared to take. We were naively ignorant. On the evening of the pill-popping party, I picked up Chloe at about 7.30 from her home after she'd eaten dinner so that her stomach was lined. I'd never met her mother, so when she opened the door, I was taken rather aback. Chloe's mother was an attractive woman and looked a lot like her daughter. Hello, Lennox, she said, gesturing me to come into the house. Chloe will be down in a moment. She asked me all about myself and was terribly friendly, insisting that she didn't want Chloe to wake her up when she returned home, as she and her husband were light sleepers. When we climbed into the car, Chloe showed me the pills she had stolen from her mother's medicine drawer. Chloe was nervous, much more so than usual. She told me she was sceptical about whether my friends would actually accept her. I told her to stop being silly. If she was my girlfriend, of course they'd accept her. I sensed she was troubled about popping pills. Chloe had never taken drugs of any kind before. She had smoked a joint on one occasion and drank a wee bit of alcohol from time to time. But in terms of her experiences with drugs, she'd never had a high before. I suspect she was rather intimidated about taking something that was strangely unfamiliar to her. I think I could appreciate that, for I was reluctant the first time I knocked back some prescription medications, so I understood her hesitancy. After I first experienced those waves of idyllic euphoria from the meds I'd taken, I became rather addicted to pill-popping. It represented an opportunity for me to escape the rat race of daily life. I was as boldly uninhibited and adventurous as a wild stallion, bolting away from its stable block. There was no holding me back. So yes, I was looking extremely forward to this party, and I was certainly hoping with all my heart that Chloe would also have a wild time, and I was anticipating that she likely would. I wanted her to fully experience a rush of euphoria, but that ominous party we were about to attend would leave us scarred for life 
and adverse to experimenting with any kind of narcotics. Once bitten, twice shy, definitely applied to us. It was supposed to be summer, but it seemed like anything but. It was a very nippy evening, and most people arrived at the party feeling pretty chilly. But luckily the girl who was hosting the party had organised some heating lamps in the large entertainment area, so when we arrived at the party it was pleasantly warm. Kelly Carpenter's parents were out of state, so she knew we could use the barn without her parents suspecting a thing. It was regularly used by them as a wedding venue on their sizeable plot of land, which was called Misty Hills. It was the quintessential place to have a fabulous party, especially without suspicious adults breathing down our backs and clandestinely watching our every move. Parties like that were very lame. It was a stroke of luck that the previous party hosted at the barn was in fact a barn dance, so there were haystacks strewn around the place that were so comfortable to lie back on. To give Kelly her due, she had done an amazing job in making the party look so welcoming, with colourful uplighters, chairs and tables, and a large entertainment area where people could dance. There was someone managing the bar, and Kelly had stolen a lot of extra booze left over from parties. But people also contributed their own alcohol and snacks to the party, as well as prescription medications that were thrown into a large purple glass bowl, which turned into a lucky dip, where you removed about five or six pills and knocked them back with some alcohol, and waited to see if you would get any kind of reaction. I think there is a certain amount of thrill about the anticipation. It's a little like attending a car rally, waiting to see if your name will finally be pulled out of the prize draw, so you can walk away with a brand new Land Rover Discovery. Granted, the chances that you won't be lucky are very high, but the hoping can be part of the thrill. When I arrived at the party, I held Chloe's hand, and my cooler with the other hand, and we walked away from the parking bay, towards a long cobbled path, hemmed in by large white rose bushes and hedges of lavender. We walked towards the barn. It was a dark night, but the outside lights on the barn were on, as well as several night lanterns that the host had placed strategically around the paths. My best friend Douglas discreetly took me to one side. Are you sure you can trust your girlfriend? She's not going to blab about the pill-popping, is she? Of course not, I said indignantly. If you must know, she's raided her parents' medicine cabinet. Good, good. I had to ask, said Douglas, looking heartily relieved and rubbing his hands. I needed to be sure. I've heard of pill-popping parties being busted by busy-bodying, self-righteous, prying people who can't keep their noses out of other people's business. I don't want someone to call the coppers on us. I couldn't bear it if that happened tonight. There are over a hundred people coming to this party, you know. It's going to be a ball, and Kelly has pulled out the stops. There's extra booze on offer. Oh, my word, it's going to be amazing. I'd simply hate anything to go wrong. Douglas, who was smoking a joint, swaggered away happily towards the clusters of people, blowing out puffs of white smoke, and beginning to look extremely chilled. A large flock of people were gathering around the bar, to fill up plastic cups with alcohol, as Kerry Carpenter did not want her parents' glasses to be broken. For one poignant moment, something unexplainable happened. I was unable to shake off this malign, prescient feeling of prognostication, that hinted to me in a silent whisper, that I shooed away, almost as if reprimanding a mischievous dog, for lifting its leg on the furniture, that something was going to go perilously awry. I'm not an intuitive person by any manner of means, but the percussively doomful feeling persisted, like a nagging voice in the back of my head, that whispered over and over again, Don't do it! Don't do it! Don't take those pills! I had heard of unfavourable premonitions before, but that kind of mumbo-jumbo carried no weight for me. My sister and mother believed in such things, but I had never been superstitious. I decided I was having an objectionable attack of the nerves, and I was just being silly, probably because Chloe was with me. I had been to half a dozen pill-popping parties before, and nothing disconcerting or consequential had ever occurred. 
On the contrary, most parties I'd attended before had been a blast. I will say that when Chloe and I took our pills, I could feel my hands beginning to tremble as I threw them to the back of my throat, swallowing them down very quickly with some vodka, lime and lemonade. I had to look confident in front of Chloe, who was a virgin to this experience, so I stuck out my tongue and said, All gone. It's your turn now. Chloe looked at me nervously. Are you sure this is a good idea? I've never taken tablets before like this. Don't be silly, I teased her. That's the whole idea, don't you see? Not knowing what you've taken. It's part of the fun. In the beginning, the party was pretty mellow and laid back, but people were friskily dancing under the bright lights of the disco. The mood was animated and the party electric. At one point, me and Chloe watched a young lady throwing off her clothes, claiming it was far too hot, and dancing unselfconsciously on the table, completely starkers, followed by another man who did much the same. People were laughing, cheering and clapping, while others were violently throwing up, and the rancid smell of vomit around the whole barn was completely repulsive. At this point of the evening, I was feeling slightly light-headed, as if I might just faint. "'Are you all right?' Chloe asked me, her face looking up at me in concern. "'You've gone awfully white, Lennox. You're not feeling sick, are you?' "'No, I'll be fine,' I assured her, not feeling terribly confident. What the hell had I taken? It didn't make me feel good at all. The spaced-out, whirling feeling was making my head spin like a bobbin in a sewing machine, and it wasn't a pleasant experience. I took Chloe's hand in mine, squeezing it tightly. I'm just a little light-headed, that's all. Let's go and sit there on that haystack. I know that Chloe was not enjoying herself. That was plain to see. She was very apprehensive and on edge. Why are so many people getting sick? She asked me gingerly. Some people are throwing up all over the place. It's not a big deal. It just means their body has rejected the pills, that's all. They had a bad reaction. They'll be fine, I told her. I don't want to end up taking my clothes off and dancing on the table. If I become like that, you will stop me doing something silly, won't you? I'll die of embarrassment if I have to see what I did the next day. Of course I won't let anything like that happen to you, I assured her. I was relieved when we sat down together to watch the party. People seemed to be enjoying themselves, but I was beginning to see stars. At this point in time... I think I felt remote, disconnected, insouciant and detached, but certainly interested enough to listen to the conversation, which I have to say was a tad boring. Several people seemed to be having a spirited argument together. I think there were three of them arguing together. Kelly, her boyfriend Brian and her cousin Barker. They could not seem to agree on what they were discussing. Kelly Carpenter kept going on and on about the trouble she was going to be in with her parents. But you don't understand what my dad is like. He can be a hell of a scary. He beat me up once when he got mad. He might do it to me again. Oh my God, what am I going to do? She went on and on about how she'd be grounded, how her parents would never ever speak to her again as long as she lived, how she wished to God she had never agreed to have this pathetic party, and why was it so goddamned unfair that this had to happen to her? when she was hosting a party. It would seem Kelly's boyfriend was trying to calm Kelly down, telling her not to overreact. Don't be dramatic. Don't you worry, babe. We'll think of a solution. Everyone's left the party. No one's noticed a damn thing. But that's not the point, Brian. What are we going to do with a dead body? I can't be blamed for this. I'm not going to have the fingers pointed at me. Do you have any idea what my dad is going to do to me if someone has died on our property? They soon began to discuss things in hushed whispers. So what was said, I could not be sure. But then they spoke loudly again, as if they suddenly realised that no one could be eavesdropping on their conversation. Well, have you got a better idea? came a belligerent voice. The police will believe it's an accident. They will think he was high. "'Drove himself into a lake. "'They'll never find his body. "'Years could go by, and no one will be any the wiser. "'It'll be a mystery, an unsolved mystery. 
Unless, of course, the water goes down in a drought, and then the car is spotted in the water. His body may never be found, and even if it is, everybody's memory of the party will be very vague by then. But what if they do find his body in the lake, and the car is on my property? For God's sake, people will be pointing fingers at me. I refuse to be blamed for this death. It's not my fault. He died on his own watch. He took those pills, not me. We will cross that bridge when we come to it. He'll just be another missing person. We can all say we have no idea what happened to him. The police will never think of looking in this lake. But if the police ask about the party, one person will blab, and they'll find out the party was hosted here, won't they? Well, you have nothing to hide, have you? You're not responsible for this man's death. You could say, yes, you had a few people at a party here at Misty Hills. What's wrong with that? You can say Lennox was in attendance, and then bogged off in a drunken stupor. You were sure you last saw him leave in his gold BMW. You told him not to drive in his inebriated state. Then he was gone. You have no idea where he went. If the worst-case scenario happens, and they do discover he was high on drugs, in his drunkenness he never left your property. He drove into the lake, where he drowned himself. No one would point a finger at us. We didn't kill him, remember that. No one forced him to take those pills, as you rightly point out. We are just hiding a body. That is all we are guilty of. And if the body is ever recovered, we can admit to the party. But we have no knowledge of how Lennox's car ended up in the lake. We plead ignorance. Agreed? I realised in horror these people were discussing me. I wanted to say, hold your horses. What are you going on about? I'm right here. I'm absolutely fine. I'm not dead. Why are you talking about me like this? You're not planning to put me in a car and drown me in the lake, are you? For God's sake, don't be so stupid. I'm alive. I'm alive. Oh, my God. His girlfriend is here. You don't think she's heard anything we've said? Uh, uh, she's just passed out. Well, she hasn't heard anything. Of course she hasn't heard anything. She's not dead, too, is she? No, she's not. She's got a pouse. She's lying passed out next to him. She must have taken some heavy stuff. She is fine. She's definitely breathing. She'll be all right. Whatever she took, it knocked her out. I don't think she's heard a word of what we've discussed. So we're game for this, are we, asked Brian. Remember, there is no going back once we do this. Do you understand? Of course I'm not bloody game for this. But I don't think we've got much choice in the matter. But are you sure he's dead? We must establish that he's dead. Or we could go down for his murder, said Kelly. I do remember someone was touching me. I tried to respond, but I was incapable of moving my body. Wiggle your toe, Lennox, for God's sake, I told myself. Flash an eyelash. Do something. They're going to drive your car into the lake, and then you'll really drown. You have to do something. You have to get their attention. He's definitely dead. I think we have to do this. We haven't got a choice, came Brian's voice. I managed to blink an eyelash and sighed with relief when I heard Barker say, Wait a minute! I don't think he's dead. I'm sure he flashed an eyelash. Don't you know anything? said Brian dismissively. When people die, some involuntary muscles naturally relax. Of course he's dead. He's not bloody moving, and he's got no pulse, and his heart is not beating. I've checked him several times over. So he is dead? came Kelly's voice. Oh, my God, I can't believe we're doing this. But there is no way I am calling 911. No way. Because if my father has any idea this happened, I am already dead. I promise you I am D-E-A-D. -E Don't you worry. This is sorted. He's definitely dead, said Brian. The next thing I remember is hearing shuffling movements and the sense of being carried. And then I was thrown into my car, onto the front seat. I knew I was in my car, because I could smell the air freshener. But I couldn't respond to my exterior environment, and I was terribly afraid. I know now what it feels to be locked up in your own body, to hear everything going on around you, and to be able to do nothing about it. I gathered that a couple of people who thought I was dead wanted to hide the evidence of my deceased body, to avoid getting into trouble. 
but the problem was I wasn't dead. I was very much alive, and I had no way of communicating this information to them. I couldn't lift a finger or wiggle a toe. The next thing I knew the car engine was revved up, and my car began to be driven into the water. I heard a splash, and the sound of people walking away, just talking. They didn't even bother to check the car was sinking, possibly because they were slightly inebriated themselves, and had no patience. They certainly lacked the cunning of someone who masterfully covers up their tracks. If they didn't want the police to find out what they'd done, they weren't exactly being scrupulous. Perhaps they stood by the age-old adage, out of sight, out of mind. Not altogether a great idea. I could feel water streaming into the car. At first, a little bit at a time. It was at my feet, then my ankles, and then it got steadily higher and higher. Everything became a foggy blur. At one point I was struggling to breathe, and I was wet. I don't remember much after that. Only I found myself waking up to the sound of a crackling fire. I got to my feet and scrambled over to the corner of what appeared to be a cave, and then I began to throw up violently. I continued to get sick, while someone was tapping me on my back, encouraging me to throw up. There was such a vile taste in my mouth. It was so incredibly bitter that it made impossible to keep anything down. I remember a hand wiping my mouth, mopping my forehead, and leading me back to my bed to lie down. It felt like I was lying on the haystack at the party. I don't think I was wearing any clothes. It felt as if I was completely naked, and was being covered with warm blankets. The crackling fire was so warm. I could hear it popping and spitting, and I could hear the low mumble of voices talking in low tones. It was clear they were trying to be quiet but I could swear they were speaking in a foreign language. I was feeling a lot better. I could feel my toes and hands, and was aware of my nakedness, and the warmth of my environment. I knew I was alive, and I was safe, and the sound of voices comforted me. I was aware that someone was standing over me, watching me, and putting a spongy thing with nectar on it into my mouth, and wiping my head on several occasions. As strange as it sounds, it was enjoyable being lost between the world of my dreams and this abstract world, where someone appeared to be watching over me. It was so pleasant. I didn't actually want to wake up from it. I do not know how long I was like this. But when I did open my eyes, I was startled to find I was actually in a cave, as the walls that swaddled me on every side were made of stone. And a soft gossamer light pierced through a crack in the opening of the cave, which was sumptuously cosy. I could see the leftover charcoal from a recent fire in the middle of the floor, and was fully aware of the fact that I was lying on a bed made from straw, covered in moss, and my body was covered in deer pelts. For a moment I thought I had to be dreaming, for waking up in a cave was not a normal experience to me. That was when I saw movement in the corner of the cave, and to my astonishment a seven-foot-tall female Bigfoot with an angelic-looking face and the kindest eyes I have ever beheld, came dashing over to me. She was covered in long, dark brown hair, and was powerfully built, and despite how intimidating she was in her appearance, I absolutely knew I was safe in her charge. When she walked over to me, her eyes were troubled. She was looking at me up and down. She spoke to me tenderly, and it was only much later that I realised that I understood everything she was saying. Kolota kikakui, ha sokola tinali, a zikali kolopo. You had us worried. You were in a bad way. They tried to drown you, because they thought you were dead. But you're alive. Your spirit was in detro. What does that mean? I asked her. She went into great length to explain to me what detro meant. Colote, aquí la cuasa a detro, lica si colona, a sa cuasa aniquila, y si la tolo. It means you appear to be dead, but you're not. We can see the spirit realm, you see. My partner realized your body was being plunged into water, and that you needed to be rescued, for you would have drowned in that water. Your friends believed you were dead, because of your detro spirit, which can be very deceptive. They were scared, your friends. Don't judge them too harshly. Kali kaswani, olo shaki, lo bari kaniko, hosani kala zela do, dila zana idetro, likolo sipa. 
When we brought you here, your body appeared to be dead, but your spirit was in detro. We knew you were caught between two worlds. We had to get the stuff you'd swallowed out of your system. We gave you bitter herbs to make you very sick. Do you remember? You kept getting violently sick. At one point, we very nearly lost you. We put eagle's feathers on your neck and a strength stone in your hand and carried on putting bitter herbs down your throat and honey water to give you strength. Now you need to go back and lie down. I do remember my head was spinning, so I returned to bed, feeling very floaty at one point. But the female Bigfoot encouraged me to put on my clothes, which I did in a hazy fog. I remember being consciously aware of the fire going at night and the sound of the Bigfoots talking and playing games together. I frequently heard whistling and sometimes snorting when the Bigfoots were sleeping. I vaguely remember the blurred silhouettes of five creatures standing over me with concern in their dark eyes. They talked about me an awful lot, and occasionally someone would sit by me, patting my back. I always heard the voice in my head saying, "'You're out of detro. Give your spirit time to settle in your body, and then you will grow strong.' I remember when I did regain my strength, five Bigfoots were standing over me, wishing me well. Golati casa, lotola pasa, hoshanaka. We don't want you to remember your time in this cave, I was told. We need to give you amnesia. I want you to look into my partner's eyes. Please, I begged, don't let me forget everything. I want to remember being here. The Bigfoots were reluctant, and the female said to the male, Let him remember a few details, in a month's time or so. And by then, even if he speaks, many will not believe his story. Very well, said the male Bigfoot. I thanked the Bigfoots profusely for taking care of me. And then I looked into the Bigfoot's eyes. And after that, I remembered nothing, until a farmer found me wandering around his woodgrove, looking confused and disorientated, and he called the police. I was subsequently taken home with my parents standing over my bed, asking me where on earth I had been. And, of course, I could not tell them. Sweetheart, can you try and remember what happened to you? My mother asked me. We established you went to a pill-popping party at Misty Hills. I wish to God you hadn't done something like that. Your BMW was hauled out of a lake. The door was pulled off its hinges. But you, you were nowhere to be found. We all thought you were dead. And now a farmer riding his ATV in the woodgrove three days after you went missing finds you wandering around the woods looking delirious. At first you didn't even know your name. You didn't even know who I was. For weeks after the event, I could give my parents no answers to any of their questions until one day my memory came back. But out of respect for the Bigfoot family that rescued me, I chose to say nothing. But Chloe was to learn my story when we got married five years later, and it is only now I am sharing my story with you, in this anonymous forum, and whether you believe my story or not, is water off a duck's back to me. So there you are. That's my story. Wow, what an incredible story. What can I say? Um, All I know is that when you take drugs, it can be incredibly dangerous, and especially prescription medications. I do admire the courage of taking something that is so, you know, you don't know what it is and you have no idea what kind of result it's going to have on your body. But of course, Lennox is absolutely right about it. It is very frightening to take something and to have that kind of a reaction. And I cannot imagine knowing you're not dead and these people are trying to bury your body because they're afraid of getting into trouble. So they want to get rid of the evidence and all the time you're alive. Do you know in the olden days, um, people would often bury people with a bell on their toes so that should you actually have been buried alive, you can ring the bell on your toe to alert people to the fact that you are actually alive. It is possible to actually be alive and people to think you're dead. Well, hello there. I hope you enjoyed the Omnibus edition. We've got many more coming our, our way for you to listen to. Sending you love wherever you are in the world, in North America, Canada, Kenya, wherever you may be, I send you lots and lots of love. 
Thank you for listening to my omnibus and I really do hope you enjoyed it because that's the whole idea about it is to give you some interesting stories to listen to. So until next time, goodbye and good night.